What was the afternoon talk yesterday? Ah, uh, solar physics. So oh. Piyali had one lecture uh -huh. and uh, one tutorial, which uh, Rajguru and Piyali conducted. Mm. So it went on till uh, five thirty. Was supposed mm -hmm. to end earlier, but yeah, people had a lot of questions, which was very nice. No, I'm happy the students have lots of questions. Mm. Yes. So more questions are welcome. Mm. Lots of, but uh, I wish we could make them ask the question directly. So maybe yeah. we can experiment in your in your talk. Uh, sure. We can experiment. Okay. If it takes too much time, then we will stop it. But a few of them can uh, can ask them to unmute and ask directly. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Fine. Mm. I'll keep track of the timing too. So if it, uh, if it, I'll, I'll, I'll say if it, uh, if I want to finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'm, I'll warn you only uh, 10 minutes before yeah, it should end. Yeah, no problem. Which 11 o'clock, right? Yeah, uh, 11, 10 50 is the end, one 10, hour, 50 okay. minutes. Okay. So 10 40, I'll warn you. Okay. So the volunteers, we have Sharmila, I can see. Vikrant is not there yet. Uh, who else? Who is the volunteer today? Uh, today is Vikrant, Sharmila, and Anirban. So I can see Sharmila, but I don't see Anirban and Vikrant yet. <clears throat> I'll send them a message. Okay, so is it the right person, right? Sharmila, I assigned them. I think so. So Jayant, I will be attending your lecture as a student myself because these oh, days I, I want to is. learn ISM. Okay, the current has come. So while we wait for people, I want to make an announcement to all the students, participants. I will repeat it again when more people are there during the coffee break. So uh, we have, uh, if you look to the IIA summer school page, there is now a section called tutorials. So please uh, look at that from time to time. So for every day, uh, we will be uploading, if required, we will be uploading tutorial materials there. So for example, for yesterday's Rajguru's uh, tutorial session, the material is uploaded there. You can download it. And like he said, you can play around with the data the way he explained to you. Uh, then for today, today's session, uh, the... We have some instructions given 
for IRAF, uh, installing IRAF and BS9. Uh, but uh, yes, it is only, the instruction says only for Ubuntu. Uh, but I think the, the tutors will explain to you what to do for Windows later. So please hang on, wait till they explain. And the uh, other material for lectures, PPT and so on, uh, uh, we will upload it as and when the lecturers give us the material. So please wait for, for them to give and we will upload.
Okay, so it is time now. I think people are still joining, but I think we should start on time. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Let us begin the second day's lectures. Today, we will, the topics that we will focus on will be the interstellar medium and stars. So the, there is a slight change in the program from the one that you have received. So we have uh, Jayant who will give the first lecture on interstellar medium. So Jayant, please start. Okay, is my screen visible? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, so uh, uh, hello again. And uh, today what I'm gonna be talking about is the stuff that I'm actually working on scientifically, which is the interstellar medium. And so what is the interstellar medium? Well, the name tells you exactly what it is. It's matter between the stars interstellar matter and it's comprised of gas and dust when i say dust i don't mean the dust in your living room this is uh, astronomical dust which i'll i'll get into later uh, the interstellar matter comprises about 15 percent of the mass of the galaxy and uh, i'm sorry for the background noise by the way it's raining quite hard here and uh, about 1% of the mass of the interstellar medium is in the uh, form of dust. 90, 99% is gas, about 1% is dust. And just to put this in perspective, the uh, uh, density that we talk about in interstellar space is something like an average density of one atom per cubic centimeter. If you look on the uh, Earth, any the the the, the typical uh, uh, gas density in, in 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 this room, for instance, is Avogadro's number per uh, whatever ten to the twenty third atoms per per cubic uh, meter or whatever it is, and a density of uh, ten to the minus eight that 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 that's uh, that's a low density, but densities in space are much less than anything that you might get on the Earth. And what this means is that the physics is different. On the Earth, a lot of the physics is governed by collision mechanics. Uh, gas particles collide with each other, and uh, and then uh, they uh, they excite themselves or de-excite because of collisions. In space, there are no collisions. So now here's a typical uh, uh, interstellar net. Uh, uh, could you just excuse me for one second? Just have to let the dog inside. Hey. Uh, uh, so in the meantime, people, please stop discussing about the software installation. Please focus on the lecture. You can discuss it during the tea break. There is plenty of time later. Sorry about that. I just put, we, we left the dog out and- uh, yeah, No problem. Breathing. So, all right. So uh, uh, this picture here, is, is a typical uh, interstellar medium picture. This is a reflection nebulae around uh, stars. And you have other things. This is a, an emission nebula. This is the ring nebula. And what you see right at the center, I hope my cursor is visible. What you have right at the center is a white dwarf. And around that white dwarf is the, is the, uh, is the nebula. And what this is, is the uh, outer atmosphere of the star that was originally there. So this might have been a star like Betelgeuse or a star like the sun. And uh, uh, in the late stages of its evolution, the star itself, uh, uh, all the nuclear fusion is done. And so the outer layers keep expanding. Eventually, for instance, the sun, the uh, outer layers of the sun will be past the uh, atmosphere of, I'm um, past the orbit of the earth. Outer layers keep expanding. And all that's left at the center is the, is the core of the star, a white dwarf. So that white dwarf is putting out lots of ultraviolet emission. And that ultraviolet emission is exciting the gas around it. I'll explain this a little further uh, in, a, in a few slides. And so what we see are the outer is the outer atmosphere of that star. So this is the ring nebula. You also get uh, a dark nebula, nebulae. So this is the uh, horsehead nebula. And you can see the uh, uh, stars here, these red stars. 
Well, these are not actually red stars. These are blue stars, but they're reddened because we see them through so much dust. So uh, uh, I, I showed you the gas. This is the dust. Here's another uh, dust nebula. This is a reflection nebula from uh, 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 what you have is a lot of interstellar dust here. And the stars are, the light from the stars is being scattered or reflected from the dust. So these are all different parts of the interstellar medium. We also have other things that are less obvious, but are still considered to be part of the interstellar medium. Things like cosmic rays, uh, electromagnetic radiation, you get light everywhere, you have the three degree microwave background. And of course you have magnetic fields. So all of these are, are also part of the interstellar medium. But what, what, what I will focus on is only the gas and the dust. Uh, this picture here is uh, a, a supernova remnant. I, I think it's uh, I think it's Vela, but I'm not sure. I, I should say that I'm not an astronomer. I'm actually a physicist. I do astronomy, but I don't know very much about the sky. I, I only uh, know about. Uh, uh, so I, if you if you ask me what constellations in the sky, the only thing I could tell you would be Orion. Nothing else. So Jen, can we can we take a couple of questions at yeah, this yeah, stage? Please, please. Okay, so let's experiment. So uh, Arya, can you unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how do we know? You talked about the red stars, which appeared red due to the uh, okay. dust in the clouds. So, how do we know when something is red and due to dust versus due to redshift? All right. Uh, so, you the stars that you see typically don't have very much redshift, okay? Because the uh, the velocities in our galaxy are typically on the order of a few hundred kilometers a second. So the lines will be redshifted, but not enough to really redden the star that much. What you can also do is you can look at the spectrum of the star, look at it in different wavelengths. And once you do that, then you, if you can manage to identify some spectral lines, you can see what the wavelength of those lines are and see how much it's red shifted. But typically most of the stars that you see will not have a red shift sufficient to, to make them actually red in, the, in our galaxy. You have to go to other galaxies to get, uh, to get bigger red shifts. Okay, couple more questions. Drishika, mm -hmm. can you uh, ask quickly? Is the difference between the uh, dark and the reflection nebulae the opacity of the dust? What is the distance between the stars? No, and the, the difference. The difference between the dark nebulae and the reflection nebulae. Yeah, it's typically they're quite close because you have to remember that the, uh, uh, the brightness of the star goes down as the square of the distance. So these are typically not more than a, a few parsecs at most. So quite close. Okay, uh, last question, Sri Bala. Sri Bala, can you please unmute and ask? Hello, sir. So what is, uh, how can we you actually identify- You have to speak identify... up uh, a little. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, now you are. Yeah, okay. So uh, how can we identify whether a nebula is a reflection type or a dark one? Uh, you look at it, you see, this is a dark nebula. And why is it dark? It's dark. I mean, it's actually a good question because it all depends on contrast. So here, if I look at this nebula, I can see it in, I, it blocks the light of the more distant stars. Let me uh, actually just skip over to my final slide. If I can, I don't know how to, uh, let me see, last slide. Okay, so if I look at this nebula, this is just a blown up version of this. And so what you can see is that uh, uh, you see a lot of emission here. This is emission from the gas. Uh, and this is the horsehead nebula that you see in, in front of that gas. So it really looks like a dark nebula, it blocks the light. A, a reflection nebula 
you'll see it because it's brighter than the surroundings. Now, if the surroundings are really bright, then uh, uh, then, then it's, the, it's the same thing, absorption lines, emission lines. It depends on what the background is. All right, so a reflection nebula is when you see scattered light. A uh, uh, absorption nebula is when you're blocking the light from more distant stars. All right, so now let me get back to this. This is the this is a supernova remnant, and so one of the things that you that when normally when you look at the sky, things don't change very much. So here, what we're seeing is uh, is uh, uh, it, it looks like there's a lot of action. It looks like a very excited region. A lot of stuff has been happening. So you see all this uh, gas moving out. You see all this activity. And so this gets you the idea that space is actually not very quiet. There's a lot of energetic stuff going on out there. And so that's what this is. This is the leftover from uh, supernovae. All right, now, if I look at the interstellar medium now, it's a mix of different elements. There is, of course, hydrogen, helium, lithium, but there's also a lot of what astronomers call metals. And a metal to an astronomer is not just iron or copper or things like that. A metal is anything that's heavier than helium. Hydrogen is hydrogen, helium is helium, and everything else is a metal. So now we know that there's a lot of metals in the universe. We, we ourselves wouldn't exist if it weren't for, for metals. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, we're, we're made up of chons. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Where did this oxygen and nitrogen come from? It, it's not from the Big Bang. Uh, we know it's not from the Big Bang because uh, uh, the uh, conditions were not right. I don't want to go into the details of this, but conditions in the Big Bang were such that you only produced hydrogen, helium, and lithium, nothing heavier. So what happened? How did we get from a stage where we had only hydrogen and helium to our current stage where we have lots of other stuff? So uh, 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 maybe a few hundred million years, 100 million years or so, after the Big Bang, we had the first stars form. Now, these were huge stars. There were no metals. So again, I don't want to get into why, but there were no metals. So because there were no metals, the stars couldn't cool very much. And so they just became very big. And uh, uh, you had 100 solar mass stars. As you will find out later, uh, the, the heavier a star, the sooner, the, the shorter lived it is, and the faster it explodes. <coughs> so these <coughs> so these stars formed within 100 million years or so. They exploded. And when they exploded, they seeded the ISM with products of the stellar fusion. So you started producing heavier and heavier elements. And then the next generation of stars formed out of this already enriched medium. And then uh, they finally exploded, seeded the ISM with more material. And so you have this constant cycling between stars and the, and the interstellar medium. Every cycle, the material in the interstellar medium is processed by the star, and then some of it is sent back out. And so if we were to look at what the interstellar medium is, in, this is in our galaxy, we find that the total mass of the interstellar medium is something like uh, uh, 7 billion solar masses, 7 times 10 to the 9 solar masses. In, in astronomy, we often use the sun as a comparator. So when we talk about a solar mass, we're talking about units of the sun. The sun is something like two times 10 to the uh, 30 kilograms, if I remember right. So this is in units of two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. No one wants to carry around factors of 10 to the 30 or so. So we just say the interstellar medium has about 7 billion solar masses in it. Now. Some part of, uh, is there, there's some infall into that from the uh, extra galactic medium. That is from uh, the, the stuff outside our galaxy, some part of this intergalactic medium is falling into our galaxy. And so this may be half a solar mass a year. Compared to seven times 10 to the nine, it's just not very much, maybe half a solar mass a year. We get uh, a few stars form every year. Uh, and uh, we lose about, most of these stars will be cool red stars. 
which are much less than than which are much smaller than the sun, maybe uh, uh, you get a lot a bigger star forming every once every ten years or, or whatever it is. But the total star formation in our galaxy, we take about one point three solar masses a year out of the interstellar medium into stars. Of that, some part comes back, uh, stellar winds, planetary nebulae, novae, supernovae, and so on. And the, I'm not gonna talk about any of these, but about half a solar mass comes back into the interstellar medium. And about two tenths of a solar mass is lost every year because the stars, some stars will go up into a white dwarf, some will go into neutron stars, and some will go into black holes. So eventually uh, the entire galaxy will be filled with black holes. All right, so that's an overview of the interstellar medium. So now what I wanted to talk about is a little bit of how we, uh, I wanted to go more into the details of what the interstellar medium is. So before I do that, we first have to understand how we actually observe the interstellar medium. Uh, After, sorry to interrupt, Jayant. Yeah. Would you like to take two questions? Sure. Okay, Harsh, you can uh, unmute and ask. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. So I was asking how, how to differentiate between the interstellar cloud, dust, and a remnant of supernova. No, there's no difference. A, a remnant of a supernova, eventually it becomes, the interstellar medium is made up of everything that's, that's between the stars. So an interstellar, so a supernova remnant will eventually become part of the interstellar medium. So when you say interstellar cloud, a supernova remnant is an interstellar cloud. It's just that there are different types of interstellar clouds. So let me talk about that in a little bit. I'll get more okay. into that. Yeah, so one more question. Naman Joshi can ask. There are comments from others, which I will ignore. Naman Joshi? Okay. Oh, oh, this is from YouTube. Okay, so I should read it out then. Okay. Uh, okay, quickly. Okay, so the question is, if the star appear red due to interstellar dust, then we cannot use black body spectrum to find temperature of star. Then how do we find out the correct temperature of star? When you look in astronomy, uh, uh, as I said yesterday, astronomy is purely an observational science. Yes. So everything we do is based on models of one sort or another. Some we're more confident of, some we're less confident of. So when we look at one of these very red stars, we, and, and I'll talk about this more when I talk about extinction. When I, we look at these very red stars, what we can look at is, is the combination, the superposition of the absorption from the dust and the emission from the stars. So we take our model, we take a black body curve for the star, and then on, and then we multiply that or convolve that with the extinction curve of the dust. And then we compare that with what we see. And this is true of anything in astronomy. We compare our model with the observations. And so our uh, models get better and better and they work and, and as they get better and better and as they explain the data better and better, then we understand the uh, observations better and better. Okay, so you'll see this in practice when I talk about the extinction curve later. Okay. All right, so now let me talk about how we observe the interstellar medium. So one of the, as, as when you look up at the sky, all you see are stars. There are a few areas which are bright, few diffuse areas which are bright, these nebulae. Here's one of them, this is the bubble nebula. And uh, you get uh, some reflection nebulae. If you look at the Pleiades, you'll see the reflection nebulosity. Uh, you, you, so you'll get these diffuse areas also. But by and large, the interstellar medium is dark. So how do we observe it? Well, one of the things, when we look at the uh, gas, what we can see are emission lines and absorption lines. And they're just the inverse of each other. Uh, an absorption line is when, you, when, uh, the, uh, when it goes from a higher energy level 
I'm sorry, to a lower energy level to a higher energy level, and the emission lines when it goes from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. So let me explain that with the hydrogen atom, which is the simplest of all the atoms. And this is, uh, we'll talk simply about the Bohr atom. I don't know if all of you know about the Bohr atom, but uh, all it states is that uh, there's a proton in the center of the, in the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, and the electron goes around the uh, proton. And the uh, uh, insight that Bohr had is that the uh, energy levels are quantized. You have to have uh, base, you have to have discrete energy gaps between each level. And you can think of this as standing waves for the, for the electron. So by, by terminology, the n equals one state is the ground state of the atom. And this is, uh, uh, this is where the atom will is, is an absolute, it's at zero energy. Now the first excited state is when the electron goes from the n equals one state to the n equals two state. And there's a difference of 10.2 electron volts there, which corresponds to a wavelength of 1200 angstroms, 1200 angstroms, 1216 angstroms, which is 122 nanometers. If, if a photon comes along with a wave with the energy of 10.2 electron volts, which is corresponds to a wavelength of this 1216 angstroms, it will knock the uh, electron from the ground state up to the first excited state. <clears throat> Once it's in its first excited state, there's nowhere that it can go. It has to go back down to the ground state. So an, a photon comes in, knocks it from the n equals one to the n equals two state, and then after a very short period of time, a few nanoseconds, the uh, uh, electron goes back down to the n equals one state and emits a, an elect a photon. The only difference is that the photon that was coming in comes from a specific direction. It comes from starlight. So I'm looking at a star behind this interstellar cloud and uh, that star will emit a photon at 1200 angstroms that photon will be absorbed by this cloud, and then the cloud will re-emit the light, but in some arbitrary direction. So the net effect, as far as I'm concerned, is that I lose that photon, uh, that, that photon. So, so this is an absorption line. Uh, uh, if a higher energy photon comes in, 1026 angstroms, 102 nanometers, then I'll knock the uh, electron over to the N equals three state. Now there's two ways that uh, the photon can come back down. It can go to the n equals three to the n equals two state. That will give you a Balmer alpha photon. And this optical astronomers know well, this is uh, uh, in the, that's at uh, uh, 6,500 angstroms in the red. So you look up and you see uh, in Orion, for instance, you'll see this Balmer emission, you'll see red nebulosity. And then it, once it goes from to n equals three to n equals two, then it emits a Lyman alpha photon and goes down to n equals one. Or it can emit, go directly from n equals three to n equals one and emit what's called a Lyman beta photon. So Lyman alpha, Lyman beta, Lyman gamma, and so on. If you have a Lyman ga gamma photon, you go to the n equals four state, and then you can go n equals four to n equals three or n equals uh, four to n equals two, or then so on down. And so these, all these emission lines are different wavelengths. So the Balmer emission lines are in red, the Paschen emission lines are in the near infrared. And as you go to higher and higher emission lines, you'll start getting radio emission lines. Until finally you get a photon with an energy of 13.6 electron volts. And that's enough to ionize the uh, atom completely. And you'll get a free photon, a free proton and a free electron. Now the point about this is that in the case of the hydrogen atom, I have to have a hot star to give me the ultraviolet photons that I need to emit even Lyman alpha or to absorb Lyman alpha. So the sun, a G-type star like the sun, <coughs> the peak of the solar wavelength of the solar flux is at about 6,000 angstroms. So 6,000 angstroms, that's too cool, <coughs> that's too low energy to excite the hydrogen atom. So all the hydrogen around the sun is in its neutral energy state. It's, uh, 
it, 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 it's, it's neutral hydrogen and you won't get any emission lines from it. So in order to get all of this emission from the bubble nebula, I have to have hot stars nearby, O and B stars, where the temperature is somewhere on the order of 30,000 degrees, 20 to 30,000 degrees. Now, just to show you, the hydrogen atom is simple. So uh, the energy levels are pretty simple. If I were to go to a more complicated uh, element like oxygen, then I, I make use of this Grotrian diagram and so there are all these different energy levels and there's all the different uh, uh, transitions between the lines. So all sorts of forbidden transitions. And uh, I, what I would do is I would take this Grotrian diagram, I would put it into some sort of uh, model and I would say, okay, given this much energy in, given this much uh, oxygen, this much sulfur, this much nitrogen, this is what my nebula will look like. And this will what give, this is what gives rise to all of these different colors in uh, in the bubble nebula and in the ring nebula. What, what's energizing in the ring nebula is this white dwarf in the center, white dwarf with a temperature of maybe twenty or thirty degrees, thousand degrees. What's energizing uh, the bubble nebula are these O and B stars in the in, in that in that nebula. But all along you have these. UV photons that come in and they pump the atomic lines up to higher energy levels. And then they re-emit through a series of optical and UV transitions. So you'll see a number of different colors, which you can then use to say, okay, these elements are here. Uh, this is what I'm seeing. These elements are here. Now, when I look at uh, what I've told you so far would tell you that uh, that essentially it's a delta function. I have to have a photon of exactly 10.2 electron volts. 10.1 electron volts won't work, 10.3 electron volts won't work. So I'll just get straight delta function absorption and delta function emission. But of course, nature never works like that. Nature is always continuous. So the lines are always broadened. Now, what broadens the lines? There's two things that will broaden the lines. The first is Lorentzian, uh, Lorentzian uh, uh, emission or Lorentzian absorption. And Jane, what is, uh -huh. just to interrupt, uh, can we take one question before you sure. go on to sure. that? So, uh, Arya, you can ask your question. Yes, sir. So this is when you were talking about absorption and emission. So you said that they occur almost instantaneously, which is n equal to one to two, and then almost instantly n equal to two to one. So if they occur in such a short time span, won't it be difficult to differentiate between the lines? Difficult to differentiate between the absorption lines and the emission lines. All right. So what will happen is that let's say I have a star over, uh, I have a star over here, all right? And I have my cloud over here and the observer is here. Here's my observer on, on, on the uh, right side, all right? So the star is here. I mean, the, the gas cloud is here and the star is here. So the star will emit a photon. If this cloud were not here, then I would see the line, I would see all that emission from that star, correct? You agree with that? Now I have a cloud here. So what will happen is that a photon will come from this star. It will interact with, a, with an atom in this cloud, with a hydrogen atom in this cloud. And then that atom will uh, absorb that photon and it will re-emit it within a very short time period. Maybe a few, depending on the line, a few nanoseconds, a few up to a few milliseconds, depending on the line. The stronger lines will be shorter lived the uh, weaker lines will be longer lived. Now, once it, re once it re emits that photon, that photon is gone. We don't see that photon. We see a new photon. That new photon will be re emitted in some random direction. So it doesn't matter what the time gap is. We don't see that original photon. We'll just see the, we, we, and the, the later photon is re emitted in some arbitrary direction not towards us. So as far as we're concerned, that photon is lost. Now, if we're looking at something like the bubble nebula, 
this is it's the same thing that we see. A photon comes from the star and it hits the, it, it's absorbed by this gas here. And then it's re-emitted by that gas in an arbitrary direction. So it just so happens that that we we are in that direction that that photon is re-emitted. Photon comes from the star here, comes from the star here uh, over to here, and then is re-emitted to us. Okay, so it doesn't the time scan the the time the time gap doesn't matter. All that matters is the direction of the incoming and the outgoing photon. Okay, I hope that uh, answers the question. Okay, uh, Jayan, can you take two more questions? Okay. <coughs> sure. Uh, let you decide. Okay. Uh, so. No, the point is to learn. So I, I'll yeah. just uh, cut short some of my slides if, if there's okay. questions. Okay. So cool. the point, let's, let's learn what, what I talk about. Yeah. So there's a question by Gopal Chetty, which, uh, sorry, I will uh, push this to the later stage because this is a little off topic. Okay. The next question is Gautam Shankar. Can you unmute and ask? Yes, ma'am. So, sir, just in, with the previous slide, you said that most of the ISM matter will become black holes and white dwarfs. So, will the universe eventually run out of this ISM matter? So, what will happen is that uh, eventually what will happen is that uh, uh, the, the universe will have a lot of black dwarfs, white dwarfs with uh, no material. Uh, the interstellar medium will become quite diffuse as, uh, as, as it does lose matter. You you just won't get enough to uh, to form any new stars. You'll still have some sort of equilibrium. It won't be zero, but it'll be a cold equilibrium. So the universe will eventually die a temperature death. It'll get so everything will will uh, 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 or what's it called an entropy death, I guess. Everything will e equilibrate. Okay. So one more question from Gayatri. So Gayatri? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, my question is, the same electron which went to the upper level will complete to its uh, lower state after completing its lifetime from that state. But why we are seeing either only absorption spectra or uh, emission spectra uh, in a spectrum? No, what else can you see? Absorption is when you take light out. Emission is when you add new light, new photons. What else can there be? Either you have a uh, or you have uh, both these processes are, uh, processes are uh, happening. Why can we see both at a time? Both absorption and emission. Ah, absorption okay, and I, emission. I sometimes, sometimes, you know, you try to be, think of the physics. Don't think too much of the. Uh, don't don't try to get the. It, it's not. It's not your. You you can't trick the universe by by making up all sorts of uh, weird thought processes. The language of of science is is math. It's not English or or Canada uh, or Hindi or whatever it is. It's 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 math. So when when you're saying what happens, you think about what happens. You have a. You're in your ground state. You have a photon come in, you'll knock the electron over to the first excited state. This is one atom. So from one atom, you'll knock it over to the first excited state. That will be an absorption. You're absorbing that photon. From there, you go from the n equals two to the n equals one state. Now that's an emission. You're emitting a photon. You can't absorb and emit a photon at the same time. This is, it's, it's physics, it's, it's not, uh, it's not weird word problems. Now, what you have in the interstellar medium is that you have clouds. So in the clouds, you have an ensemble of atoms. Some of the atoms will be absorbing light. Some of the atoms will be emitting light. You put it all together and you get a spectrum. Again, you're, you're not playing word games. You, you think about what's happening. You put it together. Okay, I have an atom here. This atom absorbs a photon. I have another atom here, this atom emits a photon, and then you put everything together and you'll come up with some, uh, uh, some observed spectrum. So, uh, so it, it's basic physics, right? So think about the physics, don't get confused in the words, always think about what's really happening. 
Okay, there are two more questions have come up which are uh-huh. relevant, I think. So, Tushar, you can ask. Uh, yes, uh, yes uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, sir, you said about universe attaining equilibrium, uh, like in forming and consuming the ISM matter. So uh, we already had passed around 14 billion years. Shouldn't this equilibrium already been achieved? Well, clearly it hasn't, right? Uh, what's, so, the, what's the point of saying, sh- shouldn't it have happened? It hasn't. So, okay. Right? It's an uh, observational fact. So, yes. sir, uh, how we are anticipating this equilibrium to be achieved in the coming time? Like... No, I, I mean, again, think about what's happening. Don't, you can't just say, you can't just come up with some uh, thing like saying, oh, but the universe should have equilibrated by now. After all, it's been 14 billion years. What is 14 billion years? It's a long time to you or to me. It's not, it may not be a long time to the universe. Some stars, will live for a trillion years, 10 to the 12 years. So, you know, the, the, the universe has not equilibrated. Eventually what will happen, who knows? So uh, the inflation gets bigger and bigger and uh, 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 I mean, all, all these things, these, these things are beyond the level of my talk. I'm not talking about, about the universe. I'm talking about the interstellar media. Okay, so next question is Arvind. Arvind can ask. Um, so, um, so suppose an electron is at the state n is equal to four. Can you so, speak up a little? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is there any preference preference for the electron? Suppose uh, if if the electron is at n is equal to four state, yeah. it can either come to n is equal to three, two, or one. Is there any preference for that, or it it's completely random? Oh no, no. It's uh, mm. it, so that's what the point of this Grotrian diagram is, and you can't see the numbers here but there's, there's a percentage that goes from here to here. There's a percentage that will go from here to here and from here to here, whatever. So everything is, uh, it, it's all, you, you do the calculations, the quantum mechanical calculations from one energy level to the other, and, uh, and, and you, you, you calculate it. So 10% will go to this state, 20% will go to that state, 50% will go to that state, and uh, yeah, so, so it's not all the same. And the added complication is that in interstellar space, because the densities are so low, you see a lot of what are forbidden, called forbidden lines. And what these lines are, are on the earth, you would never see them. That's why they're called forbidden lines. They're, instead of being the electric dipole lines that, you, that, that most uh, transitions are that you see, they might be magnetic dipole or electric quadrupole or, or higher order transitions. They violate one of the selection rules. And so because uh, uh, the lifetime of, uh, of an atom might be, might be very long, you might start to get these other lines also. So uh, again, what you do, uh, as, I, as I keep going back to, everything in astronomy is a model. So you take these different percentages and you calculate them. And you see how much will go into this line, how much will go into that line. Okay, Jane, two more questions. Shall we take or move on? Sure, sure. Okay, Harsh. Harsh Chauhan, you can ask. Yeah. Uh, Sir, so we use spectroscopy to find the uh, content of the star. So basically, if we get a spectrum, uh, which, uh, which is new to us, means we... Uh, don't know anything about that spectrum. So is that uh, we find a new element? So uh, uh, now that certainly used to happen a lot in the early days of uh, astronomy of spectroscopy. So helium, as you know, was first found in the, in the solar spectrum. Now what happens is that, yes, you still find new elements, but they're becoming much rarer. Uh, and the, the biggest problem is identifying the, the lines that we see especially as you get to the infrared and radio where, where there are many more lines. So, uh, so it does get more difficult. Okay, okay. Prabhat, let me take the one more question and then I'll go. Yeah, yeah. so more. Akash, Akash, you can ask. <laughs> yes, uh, I asked that uh, uh, as ISM is uh, 
is its temperature is very low so there is a molecule exist uh, and uh, we found their spectrum as well but they are weak so how we observe that please clarify now when you say the ism spec uh, temperature is low that's actually not true ism is everything in between stars and so the temperature can be anywhere from 10 degrees up uh, kelvin up to uh, a million degrees or or, or more So there are many different things, and from each different part of the interstellar medium, you will see different emission lines or absorption lines. So uh, uh, let me move on a little bit because yes. I have a few slides that I want to finish, okay. and then I'll take more questions in in uh, maybe ten minutes or so. All right. So uh, uh, and I'll I'll go through some slides a little faster. So uh, the um, So as I, as I was saying, the lines are not delta functions. Instead, they're broadened, and there's two reasons they're broadened. The first is the uncertainty relationship, which tells you that uh, uh, h time, or uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, the that the lifetime and the energy are have to be greater than h bar by two, or whatever it is. So lines are broadened just by just because you can't pin the energy and the lifetime together. So the photon comes in at a little uh, at an energy of say 10.1 electron volts, but because of this uh, energy fuzzing, it's actually absorbed by the uh, by the atom. I know I'm not explaining it uh, uh, purely in a, in a in a very uh, formal way, but but you think of it that way. And then you have the thermal broadening, and it's because what you see when you look at at the interstellar medium, what you're seeing is not absorption or emission from one atom. You're rather seeing absorption and emission from an ensemble of atoms, from many different atoms, and so these atoms are all moving in different directions and at different speeds, and so uh, the absorption or the emission will be Gaussian, Gaussian in nature. It'll be like a bell curve, a normal curve, and so what, when you actually look at an absorption line, what you get this, what you'll see is that it's a, called a Voigt profile. It's the convolution of the absorption and the emission line. So let me not again go into the mathematics of that very much, but uh, the basic difference is that the Lorentzian profile, which is this uh, from the uncertainty principle, has very broad wings and a shallow peak. A Gaussian has a, a broader, I mean, has a, a, a higher peak but is narrower, and the Voigt profile is a combination of the two. It has in the center, it's more or less Gaussian. And at the wings, it's more or less Lorentzian. And so, if I'm to look at a real absorption line, then uh, what this is is you see the stellar emission line from this star, Beta Cas, and that we model with this, with this line here. It's more or less a Gaussian, but it's saturated in the center, so it's flat topped. And then in the center, you get hydrogen absorption. The hydrogen absorption is saturated, and so what you are seeing is mostly the Lorentzian wings. And again, don't worry too much about the details. Just uh, if you're if you're interested, you please look at look up uh, absorption lines later, and uh, and and you can you can get more details. And in the wings of this line, you see this deuterium absorption line. So hydrogen, deuterium, and the stellar line. So And what we do is we try to fit this with a model, where we take the stellar line, we take a deuterium line and a hydrogen line, and we we use a model to fit all of them together, and we manage to get some hydrogen uh, density, some deuterium density, and uh, uh, some abundance. Now, once we get the abundance, then we look at uh, where it comes from, and so we can convert the abundance into uh, um, a space density. We can look at the temperature. We get the temperature from two things, and again, I'm rushing through this because I want to get through to some other stuff. We we can look at the temperature from two things. One is the width of the line. The hotter the line is, the broader the line the the hotter the gas is, the broader the line will be, simply because the atoms are moving faster and faster, and so because they're moving faster, the uh, absorption. Is spread over a wider base, and uh, you can look at which lines you see. So here I might see magnesium one here, 
This is a carbon four, three times ionized carbon line. And uh, this is a singly ionized iron line. Now, if I have to have a three times ionized carbon line, then the carbon has to have a temperature of maybe uh, uh, 100,000 degrees. So I can see what the temperature of the interstellar medium is. If I see molecular lines, then I know that the temperature has to be quite cold, it has to be a few, not more than a few hundred degrees Kelvin. And I can look at the red shift or the blue shift of that entire line. So that will tell me how the cloud is moving. Is the cloud coming towards me or is it receding? And I can see what the velocity of that cloud is. So what I'll do is I look at many different stars and I, I put together the information on all the stars. And then uh, I, will, I, can, I can try to map the interstellar medium. So in this case, you can see the scale. This is Alpha Centauri. This is about 1.3 light years, about four, I mean, 1.3 parsecs, about four light years. Here's Sirius, here's Altair. Uh, there's Procyon, Capella is uh, five parsecs away somewhere around here. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Uh, okay. Am I audible now? Hello? Sorry, I'm still not sure about that. Hello? Sorry, what is going on? I'm here. Progress. Crispin, is there some issue? Yeah, I don't know. I'll let me check it. You can't hear me, right? Uh, we can hear you now. I think we can proceed. Okay, yeah. fine. Some server issue, I think. Okay, so let me go back to the slide. Let me start over again at this slide. And so what it is, is that uh, uh, this is mapping the gas just around the star, or, or just around our sun. This is called the Very Local Interstellar Medium, VLISM. And the scale of this you can see because here's Alpha Centauri, which is about 1.3 parsecs away, about four light years away. And uh, uh, here's Sirius. So what I do is that I look at, uh, at, at things, uh, hold on, okay. So what I do is I look at lines, I, I look at the spectra along the lines to all of these different stars. And in some star, I might see hydrogen moving, uh, 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 the, the hydrogen lines with this velocity and this density. Some other, I might see, uh, I, I might see the moving with some other density or other velocity. And I, I put them all together and I put, uh, I, I draw a picture of the local interstellar medium. Now this is by far from being the only picture that you can draw. You can draw many different things which will satisfy all of the constraints. But it's a, it's a reasonable picture. And so what this tells us is that the sun is very close to the edge of a local cloud. The temperature in this cloud is something like uh, 5,000 degrees, and the density is about an atom per cubic centimeter. Outside this cloud in this region here, there's almost no material. And the reason we know that is we look at Alpha Centauri over here, we look at Capella way out over here, and we see the same amount of matter towards Alpha Centauri and towards Capella. So there's nothing, nothing here. So the density is maybe 10 to the minus six atoms per cubic centimeter. And the temperature, we can look at the lines we see, the temperature may be as high as uh, 100,000 or even a million degrees Kelvin. The cloud here, the sun is moving around the galactic center and it's going at a velocity of about 200 kilometers a second. This cloud is moving in this direction and it's moving at a velocity of about 20 kilometers a second. And so we put this together. Now we look at a larger field. This is maybe a few hundred parsecs around the sun. And now we see that the sun is here. This is what we call the local bubble. Here are various molecular clouds here. And, uh, and you, you just see a three-dimensional structure to the interstellar medium. Uh, let me go three more slides and then I'll, I'll take some questions. And so uh, <clears throat> what we understand now about the interstellar medium is that we can divide it into, into different phases. 
And the typical model or the standard model is that we have a three phase interstellar medium. One phase is the cold neutral medium, and that's these molecular clouds. So this is the Eagle Nebula. And here is where you have the sites of star formation. And, and uh, uh, again, as, as we saw in the Horsehead Nebula, here's a star here. It looks red, it's actually blue, it's a young star, but, uh, but it looks red because we're looking at it through all that dust. And uh, uh, yeah, so this is, this is a lot of dust and gas. Temperature is uh, anywhere from 20 degrees in the center out to 100 degrees Kelvin at the edge. And the density is maybe an atom per cubic centimeter out at the edges, anywhere up to 10,000 atoms per cubic centimeter at the center. But these don't occupy much of our galaxy. Maybe 1% of the volume of our galaxy is in the form of these giant molecular clouds. Now, around the giant molecular clouds, you have these lower density clouds, like that cloud that's around the sun. And the temperature of this is maybe 5,000 degrees. The density is about a tenth of an atom per cubic centimeter. And maybe the volume of this is about 20% of the galaxy. The majority of our galaxy is the hot ionized medium. And this is a, a temperature of 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth degrees. Because it's so hot, we look at it in, uh, we, we can see it in x-rays, we can see it in very ionized gas, like oxygen six. And it occupies anywhere from 50 to 70% of the galaxy. So we have these, uh, uh, th these basic three phases of our galaxy. And uh, if I were to give a, a more detailed class, I would talk about some of the energetics. So uh, the hot region is maintained by supernova explosions. You have something like uh, one supernova explosion per century, and that's enough to maintain the, uh, the, the hot medium. So let me stop here and, uh, and I can take some questions about the gas. And what I want to move on to in the next part is the is the dust. So okay. because uh, try to keep it more on the interstellar medium and less on cosmology. We'll take questions on cosmology at the end of the talk, if you'd yes. like. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so the next question is from Manogna. Can you please uh, quickly ask? Yeah, uh, am I audible? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, sir. So in that uh, Lyman Balmer series, which we saw, yes, spectral lines, uh, is the energy is the type of photon that is absorbed and the emitted is are they same? Like, do they have the same wavelength and energies? So if you're going, if you have go from the, uh, let's say I absorb, it, it all starts with the photon I absorb. Okay, so I have to absorb a photon. All atoms in the, in the interstellar medium are in their ground state, right? Because there's no collisions, they're all in their ground state. And so every photon that I absorb will be an ultraviolet photon, all right? Lyman alpha, Lyman beta, Lyman gamma, Lyman delta, and so on. Now, the photon that's re-emitted, it's a different photon. It can be a Lyman alpha photon. It can be a Lyman beta photon. If, if a Lyman beta photon comes in, I may re-emit a Lyman beta photon, but it doesn't have to be. There will be some number of photons where in a Lyman beta photon is converted into a Balmer alpha photon plus a Lyman alpha photon. So uh, number of photons is not conserved. And, and uh, it's just that uh, the photon that comes in has to be a Lyman photon. The photon that comes out, it all depends on these transitions. I can, if I go up to the higher energy states, I can get a passion plus a bomber plus a Lyman photon. It, it all depends on the, on the higher states. Okay, next is uh, Rishabh. Rishabh Pandey, can you ask quickly? Uh, so can you explain me how uh, ISM is formed? How is what form? So ISM. ISM, interstellar medium. How, how is it formed? Yes. Sir. Yeah, so in the beginning, it was all interstellar medium. There were no stars. Mm -hmm. So stars formed from the interstellar medium. And then as stars age, they evolve. Some stars put out stellar winds. 
So some part of that stellar matter goes back out into the interstellar medium. Uh, as stars get older, like the sun, for instance, the sun, the core will collapse into a white dwarf and the outer layers will get blown back into the interstellar medium. If you get heavier stars, then they might explode as supernovae. And again, you'll get matter back into the interstellar medium. So, so the interstellar medium, and there's a mixing between the interstellar medium and stars. Then some part of the interstellar medium will reform into stars and will go through this processing again. So it's okay. a constant cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question is from Albin, who is in YouTube, so I'll read it out. Uh, does the absorption and emission take place for a continuous wavelength and not for a particular wavelength? No, this is the crucial thing about, uh, about quantum, about, uh, uh, gas, about gases. The, for all gases, you don't get continuum emission, uh, absorption or emission. You don't get... Uh, you either, you, you have to go, you have to have a line transition. You go from one line to another line. And so in the ultraviolet and the visible, these lines are separated by enough that it is always specific lines, not continuum absorption. You will see a continuum from the star because the stellar emission is black body. And then you will get absorption and emission lines from the interstellar medium in that stellar emission. As you will find in the next talk, uh, the, the, you will also get stellar absorption and emission lines, but that's a complication that you can ask uh, Gajendra Pandey about in the, in the next talk. So no, once you get out into the lower energy levels, way out in the infrared and the radio, it may just so happen that the absorption and the emission lines are close enough together that it will look like a continuum, but it's not, it's always, quantum, it's always governed by this quantum uh, mechanics. It's always, uh, uh, it, it's always, uh, the, the energy levels are always quantized. Okay, so we have time for a, a few more questions. Sure. Okay, uh, Sugyan Parida, you can ask. Uh, sir, how can I know if the exact content of the interstellar medium the like content of the with. interstellar medium. So the only way you can do it, I mean, there's several ways you do it. One is that you look at the content of, of the, the sun. Okay, and then you use some process that you use some models to say, okay, the sun was formed out of the interstellar medium. And so therefore I, I, I can use that to infer what the interstellar medium was like when the sun was formed. I can look at stars. And that's what I told you. You look at absorption lines from stars. And you say, okay, there's so much uh, oxygen, there's so much nitrogen, there's so much silicon, phosphor, crypto, krypton, whatever it is. And, and you can get an idea of the abundance. You can look at some emission lines and say, okay, th th this is there. Uh, these emission lines are there. So therefore these elements are there. But always it's a very complicated model. I mean, it, it's never unique. You always have to use many different models. You use the different data sets, different wavelengths, and you try to put everything together into a self-consistent model. Okay, Jen, so there are many more questions. Uh, I, will stop. Doing, I have about 20 minutes left, right? Right. So let me finish off interstellar dust and then I'll okay. take, off the, okay. take the remaining cool. questions. Yeah. As long as you want after that. I, I have no yeah. time. Yeah, we are well. We can continue in coffee time. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I, <clears throat> so I talked about one part of the interstellar medium, which is interstellar gas. Now, the other part of the interstellar medium is interstellar dust. And here is the, the basic difference between gas and dust. Dust are particles that are large enough that you don't get this quantized emission or absorption anymore. Now you get solid state effects. You get continuum absorption and emission. So the dust will absorb a range of uh, energies and it'll re-emit, basically again as black bodies, it'll re-emit a range of energies. So here is, uh, is the Colsac Nebula. In ancient times, of course, uh, they just looked at it as a blot on the Milky Way. Now we know that uh, the Milky Way is behind this nebula. This nebula is a few hundred parsecs from us. 
and you get the disk of the Milky Way behind that. All right, and oh, what happened? Okay, good. So now uh, when, I, when I look, I told you that was in absorption. So we're seeing the dust block the light of more distant stars. Now, when we look uh, further away, what, I mean, I'm sorry, when we look at other wavelengths, if we look at the infrared, we'll see that, uh, we'll see the emission from that dust. That dust is absorbing light from the uh, optical and UV, and it re-emits that uh, radiation in the infrared. So this bright region here is that same region. This is the Colsac Nebula. It's dark in the optical, it's bright in the infrared, because now you're seeing its thermal emission. Most of the information that we know about the interstellar dust comes from this extinction curve. And all this is, I, I won't go bother to explain the details, but I'll just tell you what it is. So what the vertical axis is, is an amount, is the level of absorption. So I'm absorbing very little way out here, and I'm absorbing a lot over here to the right. The x-axis is inverse wavelength. So this is longer wavelengths here. This is the infrared. And this is the ultraviolet, the shortest wavelengths over here. The reason it's plotted like this is because there's not much that's happening over at the longer wavelengths. Most of the action is at the shorter wavelengths. So I want to spread that out so that I see more of it. So what does this tell us about the interstellar grains? Firstly, there's not very much absorption in the infrared or at longer wavelengths. So that tells us that the biggest grains are about a micron or so in size. Uh, in the same way that radio waves don't notice people, the infrared uh, light or, or the longer wavelength light doesn't notice dust grains. So, so it tells us that the, the dust must be less than about a micron in size. Now there's one population of dust grains that you get a steadily increasing number as you get over into the ultraviolet. And so uh, the, you, you can say that the number density of dust grains increases as you go to smaller grains <clears throat> until you get this big feature here. And this is called the 2165 uh, angstrom bump. And what this is from is from, uh, is from graphite. Uh, the, we know that it has to be from something, there has to be a lot of whatever this is. And so the only elements that it can be is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, nothing else. It can't be uranium, for instance, because there's just not enough uranium in the, in the universe. So it's, uh, it has to be one of these elements that's reasonably common. And the only thing that we know that works, or one of the things that we know, maybe I'll say the most likely thing that works, is carbon in the form of graphite. You know that carbon comes in many different forms, diamonds, amor amorphous carbon, graphites, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and so on. But this is carbon in the form of graphite. And so, uh, uh, so that's what this bump is. And then as you go to shorter wavelengths, there's a steady increase in the amount of absorption. So now there's an extra population of small grains. And uh, we think that these small grains are made up of these uh, uh, benzene rings, essentially. <coughs> what are called polycyclic, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAS, <clears throat> which is basically carbon in the form of benzene rings. So this extinction curve tells us a lot about the composition of the interstellar dust grains. Now, if we look again, I won't explain this in much detail, but what we see, the vertical axis shows us the amount of gas. The horizontal axis, the x-axis, shows us the amount of absorption. So what we see is that where there's a lot of absorption, a lot of dust absorption, there's a lot of gas. And so this tells us that where there's a lot of gas, there's a lot of dust. The dust and the gas are pretty well correlated, which makes sense. Yeah, it's all interstellar medium. Where there's a lot of gas, there's a lot of dust. Now, if we want to look at the composition of the interstellar dust, some clues we get from the extinction curve, some clues we'll get from uh, 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 infra the infrared emission, and I'll, I'll show you that in a couple of slides. But some of it we, we have to infer. And the way we infer it 
is that we know that if we take a volume of, the, of, of space, what is there? There's stars, there's gas, and there's dust. So the stars are a snapshot of the interstellar medium when the stars were formed. In the case of the sun, as I said earlier, the sun was formed about 5 billion years ago. So the sun will tell you what the interstellar medium was like 5 billion years ago. If I look at an O star or a B star, those stars are much younger, only a few million years or a few tens of million years old. So there'll be a snapshot of the interstellar medium a few million years ago. Now, how I measure the abundance in those stars is another matter. Maybe uh, Gajendra will talk a little bit about that in his, his talk. But let me just say that, again, it's complicated because all you see is you see the surface emission of the star. And so you have to use various models for stellar evolution and stellar composition to come out with, with uh, to, 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 to uh, infer what the composition of the star is from its uh, surface. Uh, absorption and emission lines. All right, so, so we know what the star is, and then we know what the interstellar gas is like, because I look at the absorption and the emission lines from the, uh, that, that I see in that interstellar medium. And we hope that what is left, if we subtract the gas from the stars, whatever is left is what goes into dust. And so this is called a depletion argument. And what we do is that uh, we look at the abundance of the interstellar medium. We can use different measures for what, the, uh, what it should be. Uh, we can use the sun, we can use uh, stars, we can use some, some uh, mix. But more or less what we know is that as we go to higher condensation temperatures, we find that more of the material is missing from the interstellar gas. And so the assumption is that, the, is that if they're missing from the interstellar gas, they must go into the interstellar dust. And so, uh, so we assume that, uh, that the interstellar dust is that the heavier elements, things like carbon, things like uh, silicon, magnesium, a lot of that goes into interstellar dust, a lot of iron, uh, they're, they're missing from the gas. And so where are they? They must be in the interstellar dust. Now, as you can tell, this is a lot of inferences put together. So we have no, no real idea. Ideally, what we would like to do, we would like to go and measure the interstellar dust, but that's a hard thing to do. So uh, something like Voyager, it's, it's way out. Maybe it's beyond the solar system. Maybe it's still not. But whatever it is, we don't have any way of getting that uh, material back. There are some missions like the Rosetta mission, which have an instrument to measure the composition of the interstellar dust. These have had problems. And uh, uh, as, as it happens, you look out and uh, you hope that uh, some of the grains that come from uh, the direction of out of the solar system are actually extra solar dust grains, interstellar dust grains. And, but again, it's a, it's a hard thing to measure. So, so we look at some of this and we try to measure it. And, and we, we, uh, we, we infer, as I said, that the dust grains are made up of these heavier elements. Okay, could you mute yourself, whoever, whoever that was? All right, now, <clears throat> another way to look at it is by emission lines. And uh, we can look at emission from the interstellar dust. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things they've done is they've looked at it in the infrared. And so here at this, in this lower curve is uh, emission from the Orion bar. And you see that it's very similar to this emission. What they did was they took a, a box of air from Los Angeles and they took the Raman spectra of that. And so it's very similar. So what are you seeing? If you're seeing incompletely burned hydrocarbons. These are basically these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that I said, benzene rings. And so we know that there's a lot of these PAS, these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the interstellar medium. So now if we were to look at the, at the nature of the interstellar dust, we have different populations. We know this from the extinction curve that I already talked about. 
<clears throat> we talked about, we know that from the extinction curve. <clears throat> and so we have these larger dust grains that are anywhere from uh, uh, 50 molecules in size or 50 atoms in size up to a micron in size. The smaller of these dust grains, those from maybe a 50 uh, atoms in size to 100 atoms in size, those are, are some sort of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, benzene rings. And the bigger ones, well, we don't really know what their structure is. And we have to go back and think about uh, uh, what the formation of, of these uh, dust grains were. So the idea now is that these dust grains are formed in the, it's not likely that they're formed in the interstellar medium, simply because the interstellar medium is too uh, uh, diffuse. Uh, if you're, it's hard enough to get two atoms to collide. Now, if you're trying to get 50 atoms to collide or 100 atoms or 10,000 atoms to collide, the, the time scales are just way too long. So uh, what we think is that maybe these dust grains are formed in the atmospheres of late star, late type stars, because in the atmospheres of these late type stars, the temperatures are much lower. There may be a few hundred degrees to maybe a thousand degrees Kelvin, so not hot enough to dissociate the gas, the the uh, grains completely. In the atmosphere of our sun, the sun is five thousand degrees, so five thousand degrees is probably too hot to form any sort of complex molecules. But if, you're, if the temperature of a red giant, if it's only a, a 600, 700 degrees, well, maybe there you can start to form molecules. And so the idea is that maybe these dust grains are formed in the outer, outer atmospheres of these cool stars. And then as you saw in the ring nebula, these atmospheres go out and they uh, become part of the interstellar medium. Now, once they become part of the interstellar medium, now they cycle through our galaxy. The mixing time in our galaxy is a few tens of millions of years, 50, 100 million years. And so they'll cycle through the galaxy. And as they cycle through, they get in some regions where they're maybe near hot stars and they'll be in a very intense radiation environment. Sometimes maybe they'll be in the center of a molecular cloud where it's very cold and so uh, uh, cold and dense. And so they start to pick up more complex things. So one idea of a dust grain is this core mantle dust grain here, where you get a, a very refractory core, a core that's hard to evaporate. And that core may be formed of silicates, of iron, manganese, tungsten, all these, all these elements that are hard to evaporate off. Now, when you're near a, when you're near a, a, a bright star, a hot star, then all that's left is this core because everything else is just evaporated off. As you go from that to maybe a center of a molecular cloud, so now it starts, it's colder there and you start to accumulate more things. So maybe you'll start to get some ices, not just water ice, but carbon dioxide ice, methane ice, ammonia, uh, 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 carbon monoxide. You'll, you'll start to get this icy layer and maybe that'll start to build up a mantle. Now, if you're in a very dense, very cold area, then maybe you might even start to form simple amino acids, simple organic molecules. So in the centers of these molecular clouds, you will get this, you'll get, uh, uh, you, you'll get simple amino acids. So it's one, simple, one model of a, of a dust grain. Now this is a very dense dust grain, a core mantle dust grain. Another model might be a fractal dust grain where you might think of uh, uh, atoms coming in and hitting the dust grain here and then another atom comes in from another direction, another atom comes in from that another direction. So you'll get a very uh, fractal, a fractal dust grain. And the difference between this and this is that this is a very open dust grain. You get a lot of empty space, yeah, a fluffy dust grain. Which is which? Well, who knows what it's like in the interstellar media. So uh, uh, let me go back to this slide where, which I, which I showed briefly at the beginning. And this shows me- have six minutes. Yeah. Uh, and this is very, I, I only have two more slides. So then I can take all the questions they want. So uh, uh, what this is the slide I showed at the beginning and this, you know, is the Horsehead Nebula. And what I'm seeing here is bomber emission. So I have a lot of hot stars here 
the ultraviolet radiation from those hot stars is exciting the gas and uh, and some part of it is re is of that uv emission is being re-emitted re as bomber emission as bomber alpha 6500 angstroms the horsehead nebula here is in front of that uh, of that bomber emission you can see uh, that it's blocking the light and if you look at this uh, you you see that a lot more stars up here a lot fewer stars down here and so that tells you that there's a huge dust cloud here where uh, where the star density it's blocking the light of most of those stars and so now it's pretty obvious what this is it's a it's just the extension of this dust cloud over into this uh, uh into this uh, uh nebula and you can see other features you see a cloud here you see big reflection nebulae and if you were to look at this in detail you could you could look and map map everything in detail so let me end with this slide, and now I can take uh, as many questions as you want, Trava. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so there are many questions. Uh, let's start with Sangeeta. Sangeeta can uh, unmute and read it out. So you can ask cosmology here also, since I, I, I may not be able to answer, but you can ask. Prabha, can yeah. answer. Sangeeta, are you there? Yes. Sir, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. My question is how to calculate dust mass in uh, high ISM? How do I calculate the dust mass in the ISM? That's, is that it? Yes, sir. Yes. So what I'll do, I see the different parts of the interstellar medium. I see the molecular clouds and almost all of the dust mass is in these molecular clouds. So what I will do is I will look at uh, I, I will look at the cloud, and uh, I I see how big it is. I maybe I can see uh, the lines from the I can I can see absorption and I can see emission lines from from the center of the cloud. I can look and see how much is coming out at the edges, and then I put that into my model. And once I do it into my then then I I uh, I'll calculate how much mass is there. Maybe even in some cases, I if the, these are huge clouds, uh, I, I can see I, I can see them blocking light from the stars in the background, and so again I can measure how much mass is in those clouds. So so that's how I measure the mass of a of a dust cloud. <laughs> now, if I look at the uh, general interstellar medium, again I, I use all these other clues. I, I look at clouds. And I say, okay, this is the temperature of the cloud. This is the density of the cloud. This is how big the cloud is. And I can, again, try to measure the, uh, the mass. So it's, it's a census. I look at all of this and I add it all together. And then I, I, I get an estimate for the mass. And in general, it's pretty good. I can then put that into my galaxy model because these clouds are big enough that will affect the dynamics of the galaxy. So I look at how stars are orbiting in the galaxy, and I say, okay, the, I, I've got more or less a good estimate for the mass of these uh, molecular clouds. Okay, so the next question is from YouTube, Awasti. I'll read it out. Can uh -huh. we get the spectrum of the ISM, and by ISM he means the nebula, without using the light from the star? So in general, these are, uh, if you're, you, you have to think about the energy of these interstellar, of, these, uh, of the interstellar medium. So most of these nebulae are, are cold. They're mm -hmm. temperature of, uh, uh, the dark nebulae may be at a temperature of 100 degrees or so. So you look, you have to look at the emission lines in the, in the, molecule, in the infrared or, uh, or radio. If you're looking at the hotter nebulae, then yes, you can see emission lines from the nebulae. But remember that there's just not very much matter in those nebulae. So your instruments have to be quite sensitive. Uh, most of the, if you're looking at ultraviolet emission lines, you have to go out into space. Most of the uh, instruments that we send out into space, they're looking at point sources. So they have very small fields of view. So you're not looking at very much of that nebula. And so trying to measure the emission from that nebula is, is difficult. 
so uh, so you can do it, but you have to you, you have to do your uh, you have to match your instrument to the nebula. If you're looking at cold nebula, you have to do it in the infrared or radio. If you're looking at hotter nebulae, yes, you can measure it in the UV and optical, but you have to you have to have an instrument that's either very much more sensitive, or you have to look at a larger area of the nebula. Mm -hmm. So I'll read out another YouTube question from Hemish Dalvidia. Uh, his question is, is it possible cold fusion, cold nuclear fusion happens in ISM where temperatures, when temperature is too low? Uh, firstly, you have to ask if it's possible for cold fusion to happen at all. And so that I would say is no. So if you say that, uh, I mean, there's no cold fusion anywhere. So you can't get cold fusion in space, no. Okay, so next is uh, Sachin. I think Sachin Pradeep has many questions, so he can unmute and ask directly. Okay. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, thanks for the nice session. And uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I think I'll start with uh, the first thing, which is uh, in our uh, beginning of the universe, uh, I mean, the first uh, stars that we formed, uh, we didn't have any heavier elements. Uh, we had what we call uh, of uh, hydrogen and helium and uh, we formed some massive stars and uh, we had some really uh, fast, uh, re uh, I mean, with really short time scale stars, which uh, then what supernova explosion happened and uh, heavy elements formed. Maybe you could All go on to the question. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the question is, uh, you told me that, uh, you told me, you just told that uh, about the massiveness of the st stars that is formed at that time, at that time domain. So uh, what is the relation between the, how can we relate the uh, amount of heavier elements in stars and the size of the stars? I mean, in the okay. initial. Okay, so the bigger the star, the the uh, uh, the in these early stars, the in the basically the bigger the star, the hotter it gets in the center, right? The hotter it gets yeah. in the center, the the uh, more nuclear fusion can occur. So what will happen in a star like the sun is that the leftover matter is not drive hot enough to drive fusion beyond carbon or oxygen. So you'll be left with a carbon oxygen white dwarf. In the heavier stars, you will get uh, more matter left over after you, after your, uh, uh, you, 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 you'll get more matter in the core. And so it gets hot enough, the, the gravitational contraction will, get, will, will, be, will drive temperatures to high enough temperatures that you'll get more fusion and you'll get heavier elements. So that's all it is. It's just you're, you, you have more mass. So because of that, you, you're, you get to higher temperatures. So you'll uh, drive fusion of heavier elements. Um, oh, okay, yeah. I think Sachin, you have, uh, let's give chance to others. So <laughs> okay. The next question is uh, Anisha, Anisha Nashreen. Can you unmute and ask? Yes, ma'am. Um, so what are the factors that actually influence the temperature of uh, the interstellar medium? And uh, is there possible for any dark matter in it? So there's dark matter everywhere. But we, we uh, uh, the, what is the definition of dark matter? It's matter that doesn't really interact with, uh, with regular matter, except through gravitational effects. So we don't consider, it's likely that it has a very little gravitational effect on, on, uh, on, on, our, uh, on the interstellar medium. I mean, it's, it's not enough in any given area. Now, what governs the temperature of the interstellar medium? The two things. One is the amount of incoming radiation. So that's driven by the, uh, how close you are to a bright, hot star. Most of the energy in the interstellar medium comes from O and B stars. So if you're close to an O and B star, then you'll be at a higher temperature. If you're far away from all these uh, O and B stars, far away from the galactic disk, you don't get much input energy. The, uh, then, the, then you balance that with the em emission. And the emission comes, from the, uh, comes largely from uh, line cooling. So you're emitting radiation 
in, in different emission lines. And so uh, uh, a lot of it is from the forbidden emission lines. And so it all depends on how much uh, of these elements you have, how much carbon, how much oxygen, how much nitrogen, and what the density is and, and uh, what the temperature is. So it's just, you, all you do is you balance that. You balance the input and the output. Input is stellar radiation. Output is, uh, is largely these uh, various, or is, is these different emission mechanisms, a lot of which is line emission from different elements. Okay, so officially we are now in the tea break. So the next session will start at uh, 11, 11, uh, 1120. Okay, but we can continue with the questions. Uh, the next question is Pratyusha. Can you ask your question? Hello. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there any antimatter present in the ISM? Antimatter? Yes. Uh, so I mean, there's a small amount of antimatter everywhere but we know that there cannot be very much because if there was, we would see it. We would see the gamma ray emission from the uh, matter-antimatter annihilation. So no, there is not much antimatter anywhere. We know that uh, the universe is largely matter. Okay, so next question is from Akash. Akash, can you unmute? Okay, he seems to have gone away. Okay. Uh, so we move on to the next yes, question. Yes. Oh, you are there. Okay. Uh, my okay. question is that uh, uh, in the uh, warm uh, medium, uh, uh, the ions are moving by itself. So they emit radiation as well. So how this radiation affect uh, the overall spectrum of we get from the spectroscope? Now, what radiation is this? Uh, means there a simple charged particle that moving. No, oh, okay, so, so, yeah, so you'll get some amount of Bremsstrahlung and uh, sure. Uh, so how this will affect uh, the overall spectrum? My question is that. Well, you'll, you'll get some radio emission. Okay, so, okay. So. But it's, yeah. it's not about the, the charged particles, they have to be accelerating or decelerating. It's not, if you're just moving along, you won't emit anything. Yeah, the magnetic fields will do that. Yeah, so you have to, so that you'll have the charged mm -hmm. particles going around magnetic fields. So you will get these other things. And so when you look at the radiation balance in the universe or in the interstellar medium, you do have to take into account all of these other mechanisms also. Yeah, so this is extremely important for cosmology, actually. Yes. Synchrotron radiation. Okay. Uh, next question is from Shobha Pati Krishna. So you can ask. Uh, sir, first of all, thank you for the wonderful session. Sir. Uh, my question is that uh, what can we expect when the proportions or the compositions of ISM uh, gets altered? Like when the composition of the ISM is altered? So, uh, I mean, again, you know, the, the, there are all sorts of effects that happen. So the, the most important from our perspective is that we need the ISM to have lots of metals. Otherwise we wouldn't be here. So we need this, uh, we need these charms. Uh, we, we need lots of uh, heavier elements. Now, if you're looking, you, you will get other effects. The radiation balance will be affected because as you get more metals, you'll get more cooling because a lot of the cooling will be in these metal lines. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the universe evolves. Galaxies evolve, stars evolve, the interstellar medium evolves. And, and uh, it, it's just that you will get these different effects. Okay, so the next uh, question is Rishabh Pandey. He is confused about vectors and uh, scalars. Okay. You can ask directly. Hello. Thank you, ma'am, for the answer that, uh, Prabha. Hello, actually, uh, sir, are you, sir, am I audible now? Yeah. Uh, sir, actually, my question is that uh, we see, I have been heard from everywhere that uh, everyone see that the stars and the, all the sun, which is actually a star only, all, they, all are stable. So why they are actually stable? Because uh, energy and the gravitational force, the energy released because of nuclear fusion, they balance both each other. 
so how come uh, energy being a scalar quantity and a gravitational force being a vector quantity can balance each other i'm, I'm again i have to caution that that and i know many students do this you confuse english terminology with physics if i were to say that the electron is a is a ball going around the proton which is a ball you know, that's just a visualization right so so what what is really happening if i'm looking at the sun the sun is producing energy how is the sun producing energy it's producing energy through fusion in the in the core now that that energy is then goes out or or uh, is is then uh, goes out through the different layers of the sun finally it gets to the to the surface and and we see the the sun as a as a, a black body of about 5000 degrees 6000 degrees so so you don't don't talk about scalars and vectors and or whatever else you're saying just look at the physics this is the physics the physics is that the sun is producing energy the sun is radiating energy where does that energy come from most of it comes from fusion uh and that fusion that fusion energy is then carried through to different processes convection and radiation and so on to the surface and then it's radiated out that energy is then uh, uh so so you you get some you get a balance so if, if you didn't have an energy balance there if the sun were uh Uh, not radiating out more, and if the sun were radiating radiating out less energy than it uh, created, it would get hotter. Otherwise, it would get cooler. So look at the physics. Don't don't look at don't look at uh, at, at terminology. Look at the physics. Okay. Uh, you have a better like explanation, to, Prava. Uh, yeah, just to add to that. So if you have a vector, you can make you can take a dot product and make it a scalar. Uh, and then you can relate a scalar to a scalar and uh, the second thing is you have to make the units the dimensions match so that will take care of your question okay okay yeah that's okay, another thing that let, let me just say that also that if you look at many of the units that we many of the things that we measure they're not actually physical units something like intensity intensity is not a physical thing i find it always less confusing as prava says you do the dimensional analysis but i always find it less confusing when i deal with actual physical concepts like energy i understand energy intensity is energy per uh, area per time per whatever per wavelength so but don't think of that think of energy mm. conserve energy don't conserve intensity for instance Okay, so next we have another question. Ma'am, ma'am, ma I have one more question. Uh, oh, can I ask, uh, sir? Actually, when Big Bang happened, uh, at that time, equal amount of matter and antimatter both were produced at that time. So wherever we see, we see there is only matter. So where is that antimatter gone? Because it's not present in our universe, also. So I so, think the commonly accepted explanation is that it's not an equal amount of matter and antimatter. There was uh, 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 maybe Prabha. Do you know? Uh, you yeah. Put a better thing on well, that. Well, it is. It is not. It is not fully understood. Uh, you have to go back to the early universe and uh, model what things are. So, uh, it is the symmetry is not conserved. So something broke the symmetry in the early universe in such a way that the universe evolved to be filled with matter, not antimatter. But that's a. It is still not understood. so you guys can get into the field and solve it and win the nobel prize hmm. okay so let's move on to the next question from same question by two people so uh, maybe gautam has already asked so i will ask saurav to uh, ask the question same question gaurav bhattacharya ji good morning sorry uh, saurav bhattacharya yeah am i audible yes yeah yeah go ahead Sir, I want to ask that uh, you told about the fractal uh, dust grain and various other uh, kind of dust grain. You told us the difference between them. I want to ask that how the structural data uh, is obtained. How the data and the how the yeah, these are data. these are purely theoretical constructs. 
What they have tried to do is they have tried to make dust grains, interstellar dust grains in the laboratory. So you have, uh, you, you, you take a vacuum and you, you try to sputter grains off and you, I mean, uh, matter, uh, atoms off and you try to make dust grains. But the conditions in the interstellar medium are so different from those in the lab that very difficult to, to see. So that's the one thing you try to make the dust grains and see what actually forms. And uh, uh, so that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is you can try to go out into interstellar space and actually measure the dust grain. That, that uh, it, it'll take 30 years to go out into interstellar space. So that no one has done yet. The furthest spacecraft is Voyager 1, uh, which is, uh, I don't know how many, eight light seconds or something. And the, the third thing you can do is that you can try to capture interstellar dust grains that come in to the, uh, to the solar system. And so this is what Stardust tried to do. But what the problem was, was that they had a gel and they wanted the interstellar dust grains to crash into the gel. And then they would bring them down back down to the earth and they would analyze the structure. But the gel is, uh, most of these fluffy dust grains fragment when they hit the gel. And so they just couldn't detect any of them. They have a dust collector on Rosetta, the, uh, which went to the comet. And that, uh, again, the, you look at the dust grains, but there they've had some problem. Uh, I mean, that was mainly for cometary dust grains, not for interstellar dust grains, which are, which are different. So you, you have, it's just such a difficult problem. We're nowhere near there. So we, we just don't know what that interstellar dust grain looks like. Okay, uh, so maybe we can take, uh, Jen, if you're willing, we can go on for another four minutes and then- That's we, fine. We okay, fine. There are several more questions. Let's see how much we can take. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's a question from YouTube, uh, Hemish Dal Delvadia. What kind of instrument is used to measure mass of ISM? No, again, you can't, uh, it's not like an instrument measures the mass of the ISM. You can't measure the mass of the ISM. What you can do is you can look at absorption lines, emission lines, and you can say, okay, based on these uh, using spectroscopy, from this, I infer that the density is this much. And if I look at the cloud, it looks like it's this big. And so I multiply the density times the volume and I get a mass. So it's all indirect measures. There's no way I can go out there with a scale and measure the mass. Okay, then there are some questions which are related to early universe. So I am going to postpone them for cosmology session. <laughs> okay. We can ask on the last day. Uh, so the next question is uh, Hanesh, he can ask. Hello, sir, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir, thank, thank you for the informative session. And my question is, how does the interstellar gas medium self gravitate to form stars? All right, so the only things that self-gravitate are the huge molecular clouds. So those are self-gravitating. The general interstellar medium, it's far too low density, not gravitationally confined at all. So the big molecular clouds, you will, they, they are self-gravitating because there's enough matter there. And so how does a star form? Well, you have instabilities in that uh, cloud. And uh, those instabilities, you might get a little increase in density. If you get a little increase in density, that'll start building up. You'll get more and more matter accreting around that. And, uh, and you, you go faster and faster as, uh, as more and more matter accretes. And, and that's how stars are formed. Just, just so, uh, uh, do these so it's, But it's an isolated system. Then how does it uh, self-gravitate? It is, a, it is a contradictions to the second law of thermodynamics. The, here the again, is again you, you don't do this. Don't mix up. Don't just try to put everything in, in uh, English terms like this. Contradict second law. Third. It, just think of the physics. What is happening? You have a cloud. What yes, does self-gravitating mean? Self-gravitating means that that cloud won't, this won't fragment. So I have a cloud. That cloud is big enough. There's enough volume. You can look at it. You can calculate the... Uh, the gravitational attraction. This cloud is big enough and it's confined enough that, that it's self-gravitating, that it won't fragment. So That's now awesome. inside that cloud, that cloud is not rigid. So inside that cloud, 
I will get little areas where where the the density increases enough to uh, to start accreting more and more material, and that's how a star is formed. A star is formed from these accreting materials. I, I you you're you're trying to you're trying to, to to play it cute with words. Don't do that. Look at the physics. What do you have? You have a cloud where you have enough mass in a small enough volume that it won't fragment. That's all that self-gravitating means. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we are running out of time, but I am going to allow Gopal Chetty to ask because I considered him off topic earlier. So he can ask. That's the last question. Gopal Chetty. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this opportunity. And Jen, sir, it's really an honor for me to be interacting with you. Uh, my question is uh, about the cosmic reionization process. Uh, like uh, in some research papers, I have studied that like uh, about uh, 600 million years from the Big Bang, uh, the ISM, intergalactic ISM and IGM to be precise, was filled off uh, neutral hydrogen. But now when we are observing, it is mainly comprised of ionized hydrogen. So how does this uh, intense UV radiation permeate or uh, account for the ionized hydrogen in intergalactic medium? Yeah, again, that's a, that's a research problem that, that, is not, that has an immense amount of literature. And I think maybe Prabha, you can correct me, is not fully solved yet. So uh, where does that UV light come from? Maybe from quasars? Maybe from uh, uh, what is the what? Maybe from normal galaxies. Maybe enough light escapes from normal galaxies. But uh, this uh, what provides the ionization for the intergalactic medium is something. The only thing that that it must be from quasars. Must be from early galaxies. Because what else? Yeah. Is there? Yeah. So yeah, it, like Jen said, it is a research topic. But I think in the last uh, few years, more and more consensus is that is from uh, usual stars which are in galaxies. Yeah. Not, not any extra, you know, special objects. That's right. So that's the... Okay, so it's great. I think we had a wonderful session, uh, but we need to take a short break. I think you won't have any time for your talk. Yeah, for, for uh, the gender to start his, yes. I think your cosmology session will be fully questions. <laughs> okay, so Vinoy and uh, Ravi will handle that. <laughs> I'll also be around, of course. Okay, so let's take a break. Thanks, Jayant. Bye. For a wonderful talk. Yeah. Bye. Okay. So we have only seven minutes and the Session chair for the next one is Anirban, right? So Anirban, can you please take over? Yes, ma'am. Sure. So you can ask uh, if uh, Gajendra is there, he can set up his talk. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. Hi, Anirban. Um, can you, I, will you help me to share my screen? Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, so, okay, let me, let me open my talk first. Are you able to hear me, right? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. So let me go to my, just give me a couple of minutes, sir. Share screen. Can you share your screen? Host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Uh, you are. Are you not a host? Co-host. Uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, you are not a co-host, so we'll have to ask Crispin to make you a co-host. Crispin, are you around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. Uh, yes, yes, yes.
Yes. Check it. You can uh, share your. Okay, I, I'll try sharing now. Yeah. On my screen. So did you share? No, I'm not able to. It's 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 hanging. Uh, mm. uh, I, are you able to hear me? No. Yeah, we can yes, hear yes, you. Yes, yes, we hear you. Oh yeah, yeah. Just a minute. Just a minute. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Fine. No, it's. I don't know why it is hanging. You think I, I I get out and again log in? Just give me. Okay, now I'll try sharing, uh, sharing my PowerPoint, share. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Yes. I'll make it full screen. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Is it okay, okay. now? Okay. Yeah, great. Fine, fine. I don't know why it was hanging. I had to. I have some time, right? Another you five. Have, you have three minutes, uh, oh. Jender, to start. Hi, Prabha. Hi. So uh, I just want to ask you. So the yes. way we were taking questions in between for Jen, well, what would you prefer? Questions at the end or in the beginning? In the middle? I think uh, they can ask me questions. In they the can middle. ask. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Anirban will handle that. I will log out for a bit. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, before I log out, I want to tell, I want to again make an announcement to the students. Uh, please type only questions which are relevant to the lecture while the lecture is going on. Uh, it, otherwise, it gets very difficult for the chair to scroll through irrelevant questions, okay? That will make it more effective. Okay, so Anirban, it's all over to you. Okay, ma'am, thanks. Yeah. I'm just checking whether I can go forward and go backward. That works. Yeah, it is working. Okay.
Anilban, what do you say? Shall I start? Yeah, sir, it's 11.20. I think uh, we should start. Oh, it's 11.20. Okay. Yeah. Fine. So, so, so uh, uh, we have our uh, second talk of this morning and uh, this will be uh, delivered by Professor uh, Rajendra Pandey of Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Over to you, sir. You can start. Thank you. And yeah, and you, I'll warn you before uh, five minutes. Fine. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, this, this session actually is on stars. And I was hearing um, uh, the lecture on interstellar medium and a lot of good questions. But I have kept my talk very basic, but you are free to ask me questions. My, my main aim is to tell you about stars, why we study stars and how, and I'll give you a history why, how people started looking up in the sky and wondering what these bright objects are, faint objects as well. So, so if you look up in the sky, and away from uh, this, uh, away from city lights, somewhere in a remote village. Or, but if you are in the city, I think finding clear skies is very difficult. But however, if you just look up in the night when it is not cloudy, cloudy, I am sure you will see bright stars. And if you if you just ponder and look carefully. All stars are, I mean, like they, they, to your eye, you will find some stars blue, some stars red, and some stars like yellow. So this, this is basically attributed to their temperature. So the whole idea of studying stars is to get hold of their physical, prop, physical parameters, like what is their temperature, what is their gravity, what is their mass? Are they rotating? Are they static? Are they moving away from you? Are they approaching towards you? And all these things. And the thing is, what makes them shine is another thing, which I will not deal in my lecture, but I'm sure someone on who talks on stellar structure and all may tell you about what makes stars shine. So my aim will be basically on observations to tell you what we observe and what they imply, what the observations imply. So, so as I told you, stars appear, some appear blue, some appear red, some appear yellow. So, and if you go back to your 10th standard or 12th standard, or maybe your graduation, so you all guys have studied black body radiation. So we assume for the order approximation. Uh, can you mute? Uh, I'm hearing some crosstalk. So I request everybody to mute. Okay. So 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 as I told, stars come in variety of colors. I mean, like they to your eye. So if a star is blue. Yeah, I was talking about black body. So we attribute all the stars, see like they are hot gas balls, which are emitting light. And these, these all stars we approximate, first approximation is to, to a black body. So if, if, if you remember from your school days or college days, that what does Wien's law say? Say like if, if you have a black body of, of a given temperature, say, say a temperature of our sun's photospheric temperature, which is around 5,800. So the, these colorful things, this Vibgeor color is the spectrum that you observe in the optical. So this, this, is, this is the optical regime. This all colorful stripes here in these three, uh, in, these, in, in these three, in these three plots are the optical regions. And then I have plotted the black bodies on it 
how a block black body of different temperatures would look like so if you look at like i was tell, talking about sun so sun is roughly around 6000 degree kelvin so you will see that that the black body peaks the black body peaks at roughly in the visible region okay and very close to yellow so a star which is of sun's temperature that appears like it appears yellow to you but if you go to a very hot star not very hot say reasonably hot say 10000 twice of the sun's temperature so what happens this is the black body curve for 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 a 10000 degree kelvin temperature black body temperature and you see it is not peaking in the in the optical region where does it peak it it peaks in the ultraviolet and it it so it con so in the black body you would see the more contribution is from the blue so a hot star appears blue to you because you perceive only in uh, your eye only detects in optical okay but had it had it peaked somewhere away from the optical region and you wouldn't have this tail also you wouldn't see that star uh, you your eye wouldn't see that star and and then if if you choose a star say which has a temperature of 3000 k 3000 degree kelvin then this is your optical region and you see that the peak is in the infrared only in the tail you see you what you could see is the red colors so that's why if the star is cool like 3000 degree k you only you see it as red in color so so this is so so from all these you can get so how would you so if you have a star can you think how would you how could you get temperature of that star so this roughly you can attribute to some temperature like if it is blue you will say it's a hot star if it appears red to your eye you will say it is a cool star and if 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 it appears yellow then you would say okay the star's temperature is like sun's temperature this is broad way of assigning temperature to stars now 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 how would you how would you say suppose i point you to i point you to a star and tell you okay find the temperature of this star because the finding uh, the temp temperatures of this one needs to know the temperature of the star to study it further that is the basic things so how how would you how would you go about getting the temperature of the star so as i told you the first approximation is you get a black body continuum of that star so once you can so you can observe so you so the whole idea what astronomers do is they observe the stars in say say in u band b band and v band v is visual b is blue and u is ultraviolet so and here you can see roughly so you so when when you observe a star in u band that means you are allo allowing you are allowing only u light to pass pass to uh, pass pass as that your eye only sees the u light or your detector you want to record it so you you say a simple detector say the uh, a photometer which will only record the u light and the u light is uh, from the view graph you can see what uh, it, it 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 covers with wavelengths from 3000 to 4000 angstrom with a certain band pass so you, if if you observe the star in u filter which allows only light in u and you record that u light then you point point this up, uh, then you change the filter you 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 go to a b b b filter b filter doesn't allow u light but it allows light from say 4000 to 5000 angstrom so roughly so you 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 record the light in that band in that wavelength band and then you also record you then change the filter to your visual filter and the visual light covers say around 5000 angstrom to around 6500 angstrom 
so and you record the light so you you have recorded light of the star in u in u band b band and v band what does u b and v represent they represent the band pass wavelength band pass so in in this wavelength roughly in say in 364 angstroms you you got so many so many photons from the light per second say or in b band you got 440 uh, in b band is roughly uh, uh, centered at 442 angstroms so in b band you got say your you got your recording would be at 442 angstroms you got got so many photons per second so when i say per second i am telling you can expose it say for 1 hour but number of photons you receive by 1 hour will give you per second or per hour you can convert to per second and then visual visual is uh, centered at 540 angstroms so so you you so you have recordings of the photons per second in u filter in b filter and v filter so what 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 this will tell so i before going to why we are recording photons i'll just tell you since since the photons from the star we uh, we astronomers use photons may be the flux photon flux but we as so the so many photon counts will be there we always use a logarithmic system which we tell as 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 magnitude so the flux in magnitude uh, the flux the flux which is the photon counts in b b in b band in b band can be called magnitude in b that is apparent magnitude in b filter that is just proportional to log of the counts so what is the flux in in b is nothing but it is proportional to log of the photon counts in b band okay so mb is nothing but uh, is nothing is nothing but proportional to log of the photons log log of the photons in b filter sorry and similarly uh, in v uh, mb is the magnitude which is nothing but proportional to log of the photons photon counts in v filter okay and then we we for simplicity so if we want a flux ratio between b and v it is nothing but mb minus mv which we relate as minus 2.5 log of the flux flux or the photon counts in b by photon counts in v okay is that clear and this 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 is we refer as mb as b because it is the it's a magnitude in b and mv as magnitude in v so so this this is again the same thing just a representation so b minus v we represent we tell it as color this is called color index color or simply color index or simply color so okay so now so now say suppose if i if if i had two temperatures two black body temperatures t1 and t2 so this is the black body flux distribution or the energy distribution of at the at the temperature t1 and this is the temperature t2 so so and the the, the this is the b filter blue filter this is the v filter so you you can you can make out see this t2 is a is a is a cooler temperature than t1 because the peak is is at the shorter wavelength than 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 that is for t2 so if the star is hot the peak of the black body is at the shorter wavelengths compared to a star which is cooler than that so you you see so you uh, what what you see that uh, what you see is 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 for the b filter compare the if you if you compare the energy flux in the b filter then the t2 t2 has less energy flux than the t1 at in b filter and how it how it, and 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 what about here in in t t2 uh, the t2 and the t1 t1 has t1 even the 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 yellow light is more than what it is in t2 but 
you look at the ratios see here both for this a, a hotter star has flux more flux both in b filter and b filter compared to compared to a cooler star p2 but but look at the energy flux in in t1 the b flux is more than the v flux in t1 but but in 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 a cooler star the b the b flux is less than the v flux so this ratio tells us whether the star is hot or cool that is why we brought the color color into picture that is b minus v color or the ratio of flux in b to v okay so 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 the idea is to so we recorded the photon counts per second in different filters so 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 we have the b color we have the we have the photon counts in b we have photon counts in v and and by determining color ind indices we can infer the surface temperature of the star or the black body temperature of the star by just sampling the black body distribution of these of these of these uh, stars so so this is because by sampling different parts of the black body curve we can roughly infer its shape okay so 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 if you plot u b v color then you can associate you can then visualize it as a curve and then associate it to a black body of a given temperature or or as i told you the flux ratio of v to b is it is attributed it attributes to its temperature okay so now now so if, if so you can you can have a set of black bodies of different temperatures say you you can choose temperatures from say 1000 to 100000 and then calculate for each temperature what is the flux for each black body of given temperature what will be the flux ratio of v to b that you can compute you can calculate v to b for temperature t1 for temperature t2 what is the flux ratio of v to b t3 t4 t5 so this is a plot where where they have a plot say like for different temperatures what would be the color ratio b minus v or it is also if we don't take the logarithmic scale it is the flux ratio of v to b so so this is how they, uh, they have computed and this is the curve which gets so for for a 6000 uh, roughly at a 6000 degree kelvin star would would have a flux ratio v to b around close to 2 okay so if you go to uh, go uh, go to a telescope and observe stars in filters v and v and get the flux ratios in v and v then you can attribute it to its then you can find the temperature so so this is how it is so for if you get the v to b ratio close to 2 then the temperature is around 6000 degree k that is that means this star is ha, is having a temperature roughly of the sun similarly if if you if you if you go if you if you find that it is between 0.75 and 1 ratio then that corresponds to a temperature of 21000 it's a hot star and and if you, if you find a ratio say roughly slightly uh, more than 4 then then it is a cool star now but this is a simple way of assigning temperature to stars but it has lots of errors in doing so so if you if if the temperature determination comes with lot of error so so if you, if you look at the curve so if if you are measuring the measuring the flux ratio of v to b for a hot star see see if you did for a hot star then a hot star measurements if you look at measurement of a hot star would give you lot of errors because the curve is very steep is a a small errors in in 
in estimating your v to b flux ratio would would give you large errors because of the steepness of this curve but as you go to this side of the curve in the right side of the curve which is flat here the flux ratio would give you less errors so the your determination of temperatures would be better better in a sense with with less errors compared to a star which is hot okay so this is this is a simple way of determining temperature of the star so now now i told you that uh, you have a, you can approximate stars to simple black bodies but 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 really stars are not simple black bodies uh, it it the star is a combination of a black body with some material surrounding the black body so what does this material do this material may be some gas which which is composed of helium which is composed of sorry hydrogen and then helium carbon nitrogen oxygen all, all the elements of the periodic table so you you so you it, it's like a black body sprinkled with this gas around this black body so 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 what so 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 we see the black body continuous spectrum which i was showing you given by the stars interior hot dense gas interior in a sense we don't see the stars interior but the surface and the surface is also sprinkled by this material which is composed of hydrogen helium carbon nitrogen oxygen and so the the so the black body continuum the light from coming out of it is absorbed by this material and which shows up in the star spectrum as absorption lines which we call as spectral lines so as i go ahead i will show you the spectra of stars too now as i was telling you earlier i was talking about observing stars as approximate to black body so i was only bothered about the continuum like the black body continuum but but the star as i told you is not just the black body continuum it has material around it so so the if you if you if you observe the star or the spectrum of the star so the spectrum would appear like a black body continuum superposed with absorption lines coming from the material surrounded by surrounding the star okay so so the the light is absorbed by these the material so if 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 hydrogen is the most abundant abundant so in the visual in the visual in the visual spectra you will see all the bamer hydrogen bamer lines and also so i say hydrogen because hydrogen is most abundant and and the spectrum is fully dominated by hydrogen bamer lines and and lyman lines don't come because they they fall in the ultraviolet regime but 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 for if you want to study the ism then then you uh, then you need to go to go to go to the ultraviolet because and want to observe the lyman lines because these hydrogen uh, hydrogen won't be in the n equal to 2 level of hydrogen won't the from the ism the ground only the ground state is populated in the ism the n equal to 2 is almost negligible so for studying ism you look for lyman lines but for studying stars you can you uh, and in the optical uh, you n equal to 2 uh, you you get enough the the your energy at n equal to n equal to 2 level is well populated so and in the optical you see only bamer lines and you do see other other lines of the periodic table too so 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 okay. now now as i told you stars have different temperatures so how how would you how would you classify these stars some would be hot some would be cold some would be cool so 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 earlier when we didn't know much of physics and only our we had only our eye to 
study these stars so what the what uh, the the things what we could observe is their colors and say suppose if if you if some way or the other if you could get get the spectra of the stars passing it through a prism a very low resolution spectra so this is how people earlier study some 200 years back or so 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 just 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 to, so stars what what would stars would if you, if you, if you if you so so some have so some will as i told you hydrogen is the most abundant species so they will all, most of the stars will have strong bomber lines and the uh, so the lines lines which are originating from n equal to 2 to 3 n equal to 2 to 4 n equal to 2 to 5 so bomber is n equal to 2 to 3 and the rest 2 to 3 2 to 4 2 to 5 is bomber so some so some most of the stars again it depends on the temperature so and and some show helium lines some show lines of molecules such as titanium oxide mgh and what about the other other elements of the periodic table and something like resonance lines so resonance lines are lines which are the ground state lines okay n equal to 1 is the resonance line and most of the resonance lines fall uh, their, their lines they 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 are seen only in ultraviolet however there are uh, few in uh, infrared and optical but most of the resonance lines of of atoms are uh, of various species are in ultraviolet so so just to just to just to acquaint you with the notations what we astronomers follow so neutral elements say suppose if you want to if i want to donate neutral hydrogen i would write h upper case and 1 roman 1 and a neutral helium would be h e and 1 in roman and neutral ion would be again ion 1 so so these are neutral so if you want if if i have a singly ionized species it is denoted as h with two in roman o two in roman and if it is double and doubly ionized then i would represent it as o and three in roman uh, roman so o is oxygen so this is doubly ionized oxygen this is singly singly ionized hydrogen this is singly ionized oxygen this is neutral hydrogen neutral helium neutral ion sir yes will you like to take some questions Here. yes please okay so uh, gopal chetty brahma if you uh, can unmute yourself and ask <laughs> thank you so much sir yes, uh, sir. sir my question is uh, is there any uh, contribution of hertzsprung russell diagram because that is also a plot which uh, signifies the luminosity with the color like it Yes, helps yes, to yes. determine. So uh, I, I was uh, wanting to ask if the if if it has some contribution to the uh, photometry as well. Yes, yes, yes. Sure, sure, surely. I'm all this. I am telling you all this to come to that HR diagram. I, I will come to it. I uh, just please bear with me. Have some patience. That plot is coming. So to to get to that plot, all these things are required. It. it Does that answer my question? Ah, uh, sure, sir. Absolutely. I was just having I'm this in my mind. Yeah, diagram. Just, just bear with me. Have patience. All this exercise I am doing to get on to the chart diagram. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, Anirban, shall I go ahead? Ah, uh, okay. Are you? Can we? Can you take one or two more? Yes, questions? yes, yes. Sure, 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 yeah, sure. So, uh, Sai Pranit. Kothuri, uh, you can unmute yourself and go. If you have any questions. Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, my question was clarified by someone over here. So the thing is, uh, does the color of the star determine the radiation the star emits? Like, as in Bellatrix emits UV rays, while Aldebaran emits IR rays, na? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, can you please repeat? I didn't get you. Yeah, like does the color of the star determine the radiation that the star emits? 
like if suppose uh, it's a red star like it emits more ir rays and if it's a blue star it more emits more uv rays and all yes 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 exactly so then if sun is uh, restricted in a b band so how come it is emitting uv rays and all oh uh, see you see you if you you have the black body distribution right so given a temperature you the star emits in all wavelength ranges from ultraviolet to infrared okay sir okay it emits any any temperature would emit in all wavelengths but you need to see relatively which is stronger whether ultraviolet is stronger or or the infrared is stronger or visual is stronger yes sir yes you, you, yes. It, thank it, you all stars at any given temperature radiate at all wavelengths but the 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 ratio from one wavelength to other wavelength would change say for a for a for a hot star ultraviolet flux would be more than the flux what you get for in the infrared is that clear yes sir yes thank okay. you okay so anirban is there in is there any uh, is, is yeah, are there, there more questions yeah there are one more question there okay. is one more question okay so uh, uh, samantha rath can you uh, go ahead yes sir um i wanted to ask that if the stars are showing the resonance lines of some molecules or some other elements from the periodic table what does that tell us about the star what does it signify uh okay so so resonance lines are first first uh, you 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 know what are resonance lines not a very clear picture sir uh, so so say for example i'll give you an example of hydrogen so any for hydrogen a neutral hydrogen so if so from if the ground state of neutral hydrogen any line which is arising from the ground state is is a resonance line so so and the the new the ground state is most populated than any other higher level okay so 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 yes so so if if you want to study the so that means resonance lines will be stronger than any any line from any other higher level so that's why uh, if you remember jayan stock he told number of atoms in ism are very less so that's why we target the resonance lines there because they will be strongest okay so at any any line which would be which which you think the number densities of that species is very low so you need you need to observe a resonance line of that because that would be the strongest of any other lines from that species does it answer you yes sir okay sir. okay fine sir you can go ahead okay fine so so my uh have i uh, okay i just oh so i have uh, how many how, how much time do i have sir you have till 12:40 12:40 okay okay so fine i okay i have to have okay now now um this is i will give you some history of spectra and spectral classification of stars so 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 i so 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 in early way back in 1890 stars were classified according to the strength of warmer lines see the hydrogen is most abundant so 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 the the any spectra you take the the hydrogen warmer lines are very conspicuous and and that and the warmer lines they are in our they fall in the optical region so at uh, at that time all what we had was our eye to look at that's all detectors and all came much later detectors i mean detectors in other wavelengths even in optical or or in infrared or in uv so uh, so the the so 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 at this time the energy level structure of atom was also not known so people didn't know what what atoms are 
what how how like a nucleus then electrons are revolving around it and all that came much later but but people started studying stars when our physics was not that evolved in fact we had no idea of physics so how people started studying stars in that era so the first person known to attempt to classify spectra was father angelo around 1860 he was appointed director of vatican observatory and the spectra were hand drawn they had a prism so so they had a prism and the light the stars of bright light were passed through the prism and the resulting thing was your spectrum like how you see a rainbow so exactly like that so the stars star light and here you need uh, telescopes were not there at that time so the light from bright stars was just passed through the prism and you would get a rainbow so and and that that rainbow I mean like rainbow what i uh, what means like what you see in rainbow different colors same thing you would see for a star light too so so since it is passing through the prism so so these so these so the so what what was this so people used to just study it with the naked eye so how how did how so how did they so so when when they studied the uh, these stars the spectra of these stars they 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 saw some stars had uh, had a, a strong uh, like see these colors you 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 will see them like bright bands some will have bright bands some will not have some will have dark bands so so the so how did they so they they classified the spectra as a to o a b c d till o so a means these bands were very strong and then as the bands intensity decrease so they they classified as b c and when it is totally disappeared they classified as o so a to o but but just to give you an idea so so and and as you know these bands were actually actually the hydro, hydrogen bomber lines absorptions due to hydrogen hydrogen light on the on the black body continuum okay so and you see lyman you would, so these these are your visual observations so you would not see these bomber lines which are which are the lyman series because these fall in the ultraviolet so only thing what you see what is what is accessible to your naked eye is the bomber lines which are n equal to 2 to any other higher level n equal to 2 to 3 n equal to 2 to 4 so so this is what you observe in the in the rainbow of stars i am just telling rainbow of stars or the spectra of the stars okay so and then the passion lines which will be in the infrared infrared that are again not accessible to your eye so what you saw in these stars in these spectra in these uh, in these spectra way back 200 years back was 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 your bomber lines so now so you would see h alpha you would see h beta h gamma so this this is n equal to 2 to, so just for you i think you guys know but n equal to 2 to 3 will, will be h alpha n equal to 2 to 3 will be h beta and so on okay so so here when in the classification of stars earlier the the strengths of bomber lines was the criteria but at that time they didn't know about that these are coming from the bomber lines because they had no idea of hydrogen atom and its structure so they for them these were just some bands which were stronger in some spectra and weaker in some other spectra and their their and their classification criteria was put put the stars where it is stronger call them as a slightly weaker b then yet another more weaker c d and that strength the the weakness almost nil then they till o okay so this is how they started classifying the stars i think you guys know about this spectrum and all so i will just skip this uh, so so and then this is how, and and then later 
later now earlier it was just by eye then in the meantime in 1900s or so people had this photographic plates so these spectra were instead of studying with eye now they recorded the spectra on a photographic plate and studied the intensity of these bands okay so this is how they a picture which uh, they are studying the intensity band intensities and 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 uh, so so this was a harvard project and henry draper henry draper a wealthy man financed this project and they their their aim was to classify the stars based on the uh, based on the strengths of these uh, these bright bands appearing in the star spectra okay so so they 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 did it for almost around 2 lakhs stars and and the classification sequence included seven categories namely o b a f g k m so now it has changed see earlier i told a to o but somehow in between when uh, in 1900s they started having an idea of hydrogen atom and they know that these lines are basically the uh, Uh, hydrogen bomber lines and so so they they again they rectified their criteria of from a to o they 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 then classified them as o b a that means that okay i will come to this as i move on so now now this is this is what i was telling so what were they looking at they were looking at this this strip this is what is is a recorded spectra on the photographic plate so what do you see there if if you see there are these dark bands here there are some bands here and some other lines here <coughs> so if if you look at say say if you look at the o type o o say if the classification is o then o has almost no bands dark bands compared to the other classes see like b2 b2 slowly the band start appearing and a0 it appears strongest and then it and then slowly disappears so this is how they classify so the stars which had strong band say say band at strong bands they classified them at a0 all were kept slightly weaker they made it b then almost uh, the bands disappears were classified as o and then and then then if you if if you notice the other side say f f and b5 has no no difference see see so as you come to f0 f5 z0 the the intensity of this band decreases and this would this would match with the o type but then they also they were very smart that they found that there is a line very close to this helium which is not very very well visible in these spectrograph spectrographs uh, this uh, this photographic spectra but but when so they they saw that when the when this band, some bands are becoming weaker but some other bands become stronger stronger so that criteria they use and but in this the stars the 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 stars which which they classified in f0 f5 the the other the band were not visible which were visible in b5 b2 so that's how they made the dis distinction and some other species was also seen which i will come to so basically these what are these what are these uh, bro, uh, these uh, dark bands these are basically the lines line say 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 the line lines of bomber lines of a star with a0 that is around 10000 Uh, degree kelvin are strongest so you will see bomber line strongest when the star's temperature is at 10000 k and at 10000 k 
you will also see helium line appear which is not seen here so you so if strongest uh, bomber lines with helium presence of helium that means it is 10000 then as as still it is the 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 bomber line is present and the helium line increases then means it is hotter than 10000 and as the temp, uh, if it is 20000 the bomber line may uh, show less intensity but the helium line will be of more intensity so that means we are going towards a hotter sequence so and if we want to come to cooler ones so the intensity of the bomber line decreases also the helium one line will disappear as we as we go the intensity of uh, your bomber lines will come down and the neutral lines of say sodium neutral line of sodium will start appearing so so what does it tell you that as the star becomes hotter the bomber lines starts starts uh, the strength of the bomber lines starts decreasing and the strength of correspondingly the strength of the helium neutral helium increases and if we are going to a cooler than 10000 the bomber line strength decreases and helium one lines totally disappear and slowly as we go cooler neutral lines in the spectra start appearing for example sodium one which is the resonance line which is dominated in cool stars like 6000 to to as cool as 3000 as cool as 3700 so so this is how they classified the stars so so earlier if, you, if you, so they they just classified from a to o and that was just by the strength of the bomber lines but then later they realized that it is just not the strength of the bomber lines it have, you have to make the corrections based on the helium lines appearing and also the neutral lines appearing which 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 which, which appear which are conspicuous conspicuous in the cooler stars okay so now now so so what i was telling was is that if a star is much hotter than 10000 k the photons have a high that, that ionizes the hydrogen so neutral hydrogen goes to ionized hydrogen so your bomber lines decrease and and similarly uh, when 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 you when you come to cooler uh, cooler temperatures then the population of n equal to 2 from which the bomber lines appear that goes down that that population of n equal to 2 decreases so that and that that is the main reason of the bomber lines decreasing in the in the in the cooler in the cooler stars whereas helium line helium lines appear from a excited level so you need higher temperatures to excite to to excite helium and lines from that appear only in hot stars because hot stars have that photons to excite that helium atom okay and for the cool stars temperatures are not enough to excite helium neutral heat okay and then this is just a quick quick uh, view graph which shows you how with temperatures different species strength of different species appear say as i was i discussed and this is in the optical region so for a 10000 degree temperature star your hydrogen bomber lines will be the strongest when the temperatures are around 10000 and the 10000 temperature stars are also called a0 type stars and as the star is hot the the hydrogen bomber line strength decreases and for star with 25000 when it goes to 50000 the bomber lines almost disappear and but look at the helium one lines how from a0 around 10000 star they start increasing and for b0 type stars they are of the strongest strengths strongest absorptions in the spectra and then they slowly this the strength decreases why because as the temperature increases helium neutral helium ionizes so your strength decreases but that that ionization ha only happens after 25000k unlike 
unlike hydrogen where the ionization starts at around 10000 okay so similarly other lines are also sh shown like ionized calcium this is how the strength of the line goes it when the star is cool around 5000 k the the calcium two lines are the strongest and then when the star heats up the strength of calcium two lines decreases why again because the calcium two again further ionizes to further ionizes and then note note what is this this is a molecule titanium oxide so so for the cool stars you see molecules in their spectra okay so see in the hot so what what does this show you in the hot stars you see ionized lines you see mostly ionized lines like sil silicon singly ionized silicon singly ionized magnesium uh, triply ionized silicon doubly ionized silicon ionized uh, helium so mostly ionized species are seen in the hot stars whereas in the cool stars it's neutral and of coolest of that you see molecules so this is how you can if you i if you if you have to notice molecules in your spectra that means it's a cool cool star if you happen to notice ionized lines in the spectra that means it's a hot star if you happen to if you happen to uh, notice mix of neutral and a bit of ionized that means it's a intermediate temperature star at the, i think at this juncture i will be happy to take questions yeah so uh sumit sarkar uh, can you go ahead hello 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 yeah thank you yeah. for giving me the opportunity thank you sir uh, yes sir, i want to ask one question am i audible yes yes sir how can we measure the temperature of the hottest star uh, more precise and accurately as you have shown the plot Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So, 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 the, using spectroscopy. See, the, those plots were done by just taking taking the continuum of the black body continuum, right? So, th those were measured from the V and B band, the light passing through the V band and the light light passing through the B band. But to to go to go for precise temperatures, then then you have to have you have to get the spectrum of the star what is this what is the difference between uh, i mean like spectrum means when i say spectrum i mean i could resolve the wavelengths much more accurately see see in the in the in the the earlier method was just the the flux from the continuum okay but the black body continuum but when you want to measure temperatures of the stars much more precisely then you need to look at the lines spectral lines so so what is what what is what is a star actually what is the spectrum of a star spectrum of a star is a mix of two things it is a continuum that i told you earlier a black body continuum superposed with these lines of different species spectral lines so so as i was telling you so if from the line stands you can get precisely the the temperature of the star say if if i compare the strength uh, strength of he neutral helium to the uh, to the uh, to 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 say bamer bamer line so by the ratios i could precisely get the temperature of the star okay the strength of a line the strength of a line would tell me what would be the temperature of the star but 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 the star is just not temperature as i come as i will tell you the star is temperature and the density also plays a role okay so you you have to club the spectral lines and the continuum to get more precise determinations on temperature does okay does this answer you yes sir thank you okay sir. 
सर वी हैव अ क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम यूट्यूब यस ओके सो आई एम रीडिंग फ्रॉम हरिप्रिया हरि कुमार यस बिफोर फुल्ली अंडरस्टैंडिंग द कांसेप्ट ऑफ एटम्स प्रोड्यूसिंग स्पेक्ट्रा हाउ एस्ट्रोनॉमर्स ऑर्गेनाइज देयर स्पेक्ट्रल डेटा कैन यू प्लीज रिपीट द क्वेश्चन द क्वेश्चन इज लाइक बिफोर फुल्ली अंडरस्टैंडिंग द कांसेप्ट ऑफ एटम्स प्रोड्यूसिंग स्पेक्ट्रा यस हाउ एस्ट्रोनॉमर्स ऑर्गेनाइज देयर स्पेक्ट्रल डेटा हाउ द यस दैट्स अ गुड क्वेश्चन सो so so the the how the astronomers just went by see i was telling you the 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 recorded spectra on the photographic plate will be impressions of some dark lines okay so say so so at that time when the when the hydrogen atom structure was not known they just ordered them based on the darkness of the line so the darkest line the the spectra which will have the darkest lines would be would be a less darkest would be b a bit more less less darkest would be c so this is how they 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 arrange but this was not right because because they they would they would find some recorded spectra the 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 some lines would be present some Uh, these dark lines would be present but some other lines also would come up so later when when so when the other other elements were also discovered like helium and all they realized that okay with with the uh, so earlier the uh, uh, earlier the thing was first they would classify it using the hydrogen only but later when helium and other elements were also discovered they started accounting for them also say like for a for a for a in a hot sp- hot star spectrum you would see bamer lines and you would see he- neutral helium lines also and for 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 a slightly cooler one you would see bamer lines but you wouldn't see neutral helium lines okay but when 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 they didn't know anything about the these atoms they just put bo- they 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 put both together but when they had got idea oh this is helium one line this can this star is slightly hotter would this would only happen when the star is hotter so then they made the distinction does this answer your question hari priya so it's a youtube question i think a youtube can... question okay yeah. so we have a question from akash kumar okay uh, akash please go ahead uh so my question is that how we determine the rotation of a star by its spectrum means how its speed or uh, of rotation and the direction something like that. okay so so you 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 will have a spectral line so if the star is not rotating the it will say it has a width width the spectral line will have a width say x okay but if the star is rotating then the width increases the width of the spectral lines will increase why because of the doppler shift okay the okay, sir. you you got the point so the line becomes broader when the star is rapidly rotating okay, okay, sir. okay. the the doppler broadening is the cause the width okay doppler broadening uh, no uh, no doppler broadening yes in so that that rotation causes doppler broadening okay 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 thank you are there more questions uh, you can continue okay thank you okay so now so how now uh, how how do you analyze the absorption spectra so so the 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 spectra so so if if you know our our cosmos our universe is ma- mainly made up of hydrogen and then the helium then carbon nitrogen oxygen neon so this is how percentage in number atom 
percent is hydrogen, eight point nine. Ten percent is helium, carbon, and the rest of the elements are trace elements. These all numbers have come by analyzing the spectra. Okay, so the spectra you can see or uh, neutral uh, hydrogen, helium, neutral ionized carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. All these are recorded in the spectra. So from the strengths of these absorption lines. one would one would derive how much hydrogen is there how much helium how much carbon okay so this is just to show you how a spectrum looks like if you are looking at the spectrogram uh, in a a photographic plate this is how your spectrum would look a a continuum a plate with continuum this is the continuum where this is your vibgeor color violet and at one extreme red at another extreme so this is the continuum this is the black body continuum which is shown in color superpose with your spectral lines dark bands these are what i was calling uh, i was talking about these are the dark bands which are the lines and these so lines how are lines formed i will tell you in a very simple way so so a spectrum is a combination of lines and continuum so lines if you look at if you if you just uh, uh, press your mind and think about the spec the atomic spectra so you are bound to bound tra transitions any transition which is bound to bound will lead to these dark spectral lines and and the continuum which is shown in color like violet to red this is the black body continuum or 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 in a in a in a atom the continuum is nothing but your photo ionization your continuum is from photo ionization like from new a from one level it is kicked out so that is called photo ionization so photo ionization of of any species will give you the continuum and the lines will arise from bound to bound so lines which are arising lines are ar arising from bound to bound transition and continuum is arising from bound to free and free to free so this is the distinction between continuum and the line okay and if i take a cut a a cross cut of this like this then the spectrum would appear like this so this is the continuum where you don't see uh, the these sharp absorptions so this is the continuum without absorptions and these are the lines from these are the bamer lines this is h gamma this is h beta this is h alpha and you see something here which i have not marked these are the atmospheric lines because the light from a star passes through earth's atmosphere so these are the earth's atmospheric lines also called telluric lines okay so I, this just to give you how a spectrum looks like so and then this is for you as an exercise that why you 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 should just ponder on why the bamer lines in a star which are A star which is around ten thousand degree K, the Balmer lines are strongest. And when the temperature increases, why the Balmer lines decreases as the temperature increases and temperature decreases this side, less than ten thousand and above ten thousand. Why the both intensities of the Balmer lines come down? Okay, that's an exercise for you. And then. the as i as i told you uh, that uh, based on the intensities of the uh, strengths of those dark bands you can classify the stars as o b a f g k m e. o means hot star which is around 40000 kelvin b is roughly 20000 a 10000 f 7500 so on okay and so m and then m is the coolest o is the hottest and this is how the 
if i uh, if i show you the cross cuts so this is how the spectra looks like o star hardly has any lines b starts showing up lines a has the strongest line f again shows lines g again shows lines and k m which are cool stars so these bands are the molecular bands here the most of the lines are atomic lines and here in the hot stars the lines which you see are the highly uh, are doubly ionized triply ionized lines so the main criteria of the classification is if you stick to hydrogen and helium lines a a type star will show you strongest bomber lines with slight presence of helium one and as you go to slightly hotter than that the strength of the bomber line decreases and strength of helium one decreases uh, increases but at a certain temperature the bomber lines keep decreasing and then the helium one also starts decreasing but in the hotter hottest star you start seeing singly ionized helium and no presence of bomber lines no presence of bomber lines and when you come to cooler than a type that is 10000k you will the thing is the bomber lines will be strongest strongest and no presence of neutral helium lines unlike the a type star where helium line is present but in f type star the the bomber line strength may be same but it doesn't have helium in it and then as the, as you go to cooler temperature the bomber line strength start decreasing helium lines totally disappear but your neutral lines of other species like sodium starts appearing and when you hit the coolest star your coolest like knm your bomber lines totally disappears but the, and your neutral lines are present including the molecules which show up very conspicuously in cool star spectrum okay so i think you guys know about doppler effect that that someone from you asked about the broadening of lines so the line gets broadened because as the uh, as the star rotates the 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 uh, the the so the one part of the light goes away start some part is coming towards you some part is going away uh, away from you so the net effect is the line looks broader okay but i leave this doppler effect i think you can deal with it it's it's from your school you can just refresh but this dop doppler effect we can we can we can analyze the spectra of the star say suppose 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 bomber lines you know the lab wavelengths of bomber lines but if you observe a star you will see that the star you will see bomber lines but they will not be at the lab wavelength they will be either shorter of the lab wavelength or maybe higher than the lab wavelength so if the if you observe the bomber lines slightly Uh, higher than the lab wavelength that means the star is moving away from you and if you if you measure the wavelengths of of these bomber lines slightly shorter than the lab wavelength that means the star is moving towards you this is a simple simple uh, simple effect of the doppler effect okay okay then i only talked about the uh, the coolest of the stars which i talked about was m type stars but now with advancement there are more two sequences are added l and t dwarfs which so l l dwarfs are from 1300 to 2500k and t dwarfs are below 1300k these are brown dwarfs and can be planets too okay so so what did we learn so far we learned uvb photometry that that was dealing the black body continuum of the star then we also brought in the spectral lines and classified our stars based on the uh, line strengths of various elements and one could one could one could get enormous 
information from the stars based on the light emitted by the star how far the star is so so if, if so brightness of the star is the intrinsic energy which the star is emitting by by 4 pi d square d square is the distance from the star similarly if you are standing on the on the surface of the star which is not pos possible hypothetically i am telling then the flux on the surface would be l by 4 pi r square where r is the radius of the star so l is the luminosity r is the radius and this is flux this is the brightness when you are on the earth and d is the distance to the star and so from the stefan boltzmann law you can combine then luminosity is 4 pi r square sigma t effective hold hold it to the power of 4 if you know l or r or t whatever you know if you know two things you can get the third unknown but the challenge is how do you know the two things and the third one so that is for you to read and so but spectrum would give you the as i told you you would know the temperature the spectrum also can give you the r so you would get the luminosity of the star so there are various physical parameters that you can get from the spectrum you can from the strength of the absorption lines you can measure the amount of that species present in the star and various things the star moving away from you uh, star approaching you the star is rotating the star is in a, in a binary many many things can be can be can be can be deduced from the spectrum lot of information what is required is your thought and no biases so this is how this is just a view graph which shows if parallax which will give you the distance to a star apparent brightness if you know the distance you can get the luminosity and then if if you have the spectrum you can get the spectral type that will give you the temperature it the spectrum will also give you the chemical composition but if you have the temperature then you you can have the radius of the star you got the luminosity by the dis from the distance and that came from parallax so you have to just tease your mind you have the answers with you and someone asked me hazel the hertz sprung result diagram which i will quickly tell you what it is so 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 what is the hertz sprung result diagram i told so now you know the temperature of the star from their spectral classification and i also told you you need the and you have the luminosity once you know the distance to the star then you can get the luminosity to the star so it is so what is your hr diagram it is a plot of luminosity versus the temperature so how does it look so you you have the luminosity the stars which you have known distances say if you uh, nearby stars from parallax method you can get the luminosity of the star and you plot the luminosity from the from the spectral classification you know the temperature of the star and and the luminosity versus spectral type or the temperature is your hr diagram so so this is how your hr diagram looks so most of the stars are you, you see are in this band there are some stars here there are some stars here so there are some stars here so so what 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 is it what is it telling you so if the so uh so what it is telling you this this band this band is called the main sequence band the stars which are on the main sequence are burning hydrogen in their core so that is the main sequence stars when they have burned hydrogen in their core they evolve off the main sequence and go to giant phases so giant stars are more luminous and then they also go to super giant phase they are much more luminous and then from super giants they contract and the source there is no source any energy source in these stars and then they contract to white dwarfs so white this is the range of white dwarfs 
where the luminosity these stars are very faint so this is the the white dwarfs and 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 what happened there are so here i i had i have talked about the main sequence giants super giants and white dwarfs what about neutron stars where would be neutron stars where would be black holes this is for you to think about in the hr diagram and i have not put them because because maybe they were very faint to observe we didn't have their luminosity okay so next next Sir, one you have far five more minutes huh i have, you have five more minutes five more minutes oh yeah. but i have so many things to say okay i will quickly then go through uh, my slides and then we will open for questions maybe i will have time there okay so so if you if you look at sun sun is roughly around one solar radius how if you go diagonally across this hr diagram so that the main sequence it see giants are luminous and they are say if if i calibrate it with the sun's radius they are 10 times solar radius these are giants super giants are 100 times and more more the more luminous than super giants are around 1000 times solar radius so they their radius is 1000 times solar radius and giants 10 times solar radius and when you come to white dwarfs they are 100 100 of solar radius and what would be the black holes they will be several times low uh, several times uh, smaller than the sun neutron stars okay so this is how so 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 the surf, so the so the hr diagram what it tells you it tells you it does tell you about the temperature of the star and if you know the luminosity then you would know whether it's a super giant or a giant or a or a white dwarf so it distinguishes between between the 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 uh, from main sequence to white dwarf so so what extra information it is giving you apart from temperature it also tells you about the gravity of the star how how it is compact how less compact it is like giant giants super giants are not compact compared to sun but but white dwarfs are much more compact than the sun and neutron stars are much more enormously compact when you compare it with suns sun so extra thing what it is giving you is the gravity more the gravity more it is compact okay so white dwarfs are high gravity stars and super giants are low gravity stars okay so this is the hr diagram so okay so now from the spectra you would also so earlier from the spect spectrum i only told about temperature but but the but the but the your spectrum also gives you idea of about the luminosity of the star or the what i told you the gravity luminosity is connected to gravity also the compactness of the star so if the star if you can from the spectral classification if you could find out stars with similar temperature say say i have here i show you two stars which which have spectral type b8 that means around 10 to 12000 in temperature so the, these stars are say take 12000 temperature but if you look at their bomber lines this 12000 star 12000 temperature star has sharper lines than this same 12000 temperature star this is main sequence this is super giant so if if the star is compact then you see broadened line see you the line is broadened here whereas it is quite sharp here so if so from if you can if you can if you can if you can constrain on the temperature and pick up the same temperature stars and compare their line strengths bomber line strengths then the star which which has broader bomber lines is much more compact than the 
is much more compact than the other ones so 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 super giants are not compact that's why they have uh, sharp lines and main sequence is compact so they have broad lines if i had a wide war spectrum then the the of the similar temperature then the these would be much more broader so spectra gives you more very a lot of information it gives you the gravity compactness of a of compactness of the star too and so from this uh, so this is what is the beauty if you have a spectrum of the star it gives you enormous information okay so as i told you uh, so so the g uh, the, it also is related to the gravity of the star compactness is related to the gravity the gravity is, gravity is nothing but gm by r square so this is how your uh, uh, spectral classification of star goes so it can so spectra can give you temperature it can give you idea of its luminosity or compactness so 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 this is how it is so so now there is something called luminosity class one is the spectral class that is temperature then the luminosity class class is you assign the luminosity class to it like if whether it's a main sequence star whether it's a giant whether it's a super giant or whether it's a white dwarf so 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 a, so a main sequence star is given roman 5 sub giant is given roman 4 giant is given roman 3 luminous super giants are given 1b and and for a given temperature so sun you know the temperature from your spectral classification and from your uh, luminosity classification it is 5 main sequence is 5 so 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 g 5 would be your sun to be more precise you can calibrate this temperature to finer temperature calibrations so the sun is g2 with a luminosity class of 5 g2 is its spectral type roman 5 is its luminosity class so this is how so sun is as i was telling you is a g2 v and for a cool star also you can find its temperature from luminosity class you can get its luminosity so b8 v this will be a hot star with a main sequence luminosity so this is how your spectral classifications go on so the spectra gives you surface temperature that is from strength of specific spectral lines luminosity class via surface gravity and radius how by the width of the lines comparing the width of the lines of similar temperature stars so this is this involves the broadening of spectral lines and the strengths of the line of these lines would give you the chemical composition okay so the presence of these lines and quantitative analysis of these spectral lines would yield to chemical composition this if i had couple of more lectures i would i i would tell you more about this but in the interest of time i think i have to stop here thank you thank you sir for a wonderful thank pedagogical talk yes and maybe we can take some questions if you yes yes please yeah so arijit mandal uh, if you have a question please go ahead arijit are you there okay so i think we have lost uh, arijit so uh, we can go with uh, rishav pande if you have a question please carry on rishav okay so uh, we move on the with the next question so omkar kupte are you there yes sir yeah go ahead sir my question is does hr diagram give us uh, give us any idea of, about life of a star sir yes yes so hr diagram alone won't give you see hr see if if you it you need to look at 
say clusters okay so it does give you the idea of age of the star so if i will if if you if you so if i take a uh, if i take a cluster okay star cluster so when i when i when i make a hr diagram of the star cluster most of the stars will be on the main sequence okay and then some would have evolved off so so the the turn off in the main sequence tells you the age of that cluster and that comes because of the age of the star if the star is of of less mass it it spends time burning hydrogen in the core for a longer time so if a low mass star most of the time burns hydrogen in the core for most of its, its lifetime whereas a massive star it evolves faster so so the the by the mass of the star one could tell how long it will what will be the what will be its age on the main sequence so 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 the hr diagram of a cluster can tell you what would be the age of the cluster by the turn off so the turn off will tell what mass what mass of that star which has evolved of the main main sequence so i know the mass of the star that has evolved of the main sequence for that mass how much amount how how many years it would have spent burning hydrogen in its core can be calculated and i have the age of the star in the main sequence is that clear yeah he says thank you so uh, there is a question from youtube yes so uh, this is by albin so, pj uh, so we can calculate temperature from both uh, the b minus b color index and the absorption spectrum which method is more efficient to calculate the temperature see b b b minus b color is 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 you are go, that is the first first step to study a star first roughly you know from the b minus b oh roughly in this range you have the temperature then if you go to a spectroscopy then from the spectrum you can get much more refined temperature so if you if you are interested in precise temperature determination then i would say it is spectroscopy which would lead to precise determination of temperatures okay so savita has a question yes savita please go ahead so if she is not able to connect then i'm just reading out the question so he she is asking that what is the difference between apparent magnitude and absolute magnitude oh apparent the magnitude is? is the magnitude of uh, what the brightness of the star what you see you 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 don't know its distance but if you know the distance you can actually calculate what is the brightness so provided the distance you would get the absolute magnitude but if you don't know the distance what what appears to you to your eye is the apparent magnitude right so another question from youtube i'm just taking it because it looks interesting so naman joshi on yes. the question of position of black hole in the hr diagram so black hole we know that its luminosity is zero so but it is possible but is it even possible to find temperature of black hole since no, no radiation no idea no so. idea i think black holes that's what so you what do you need to put uh, black hole on that uh, on that uh, hr diagram is the temperature and its its compactness maybe they know the compactness okay and if they some way if they know the temperature then you can put it on the hr diagram there are only two things required the compactness okay and the and the temperature so the how uh, so uh, if so compactness there would be some way to find the compactness of the black hole and its corresponding temperature so you can put it there 
right i think uh, that would be a good good exercise for uh, uh, joshi to put it on the chart diagram right so uh, thank you sir so we are already over time okay and okay i think we can wrap it up here the okay. session Th so thank you sir so thank next you. Th thank you thank you so much yeah so uh, we'll meet again after uh, lunch at around 2 okay. and we will share the uh, attendance sheet at random times so please log in and continue thanks oh. so i'm closing the zoom meeting uh, it will be open by 210 okay great yeah <laughs>